19. Chapter 2. Complicity, Law, Responsibility. Thomas Docherty. All post-war trials of Nazi criminals, have been plagued by legal and moral difficulties in establishing responsibilities and determining the extent of crimi NAL guilt. Public and legal opinion from the beginning has tended to hold that the desk murderers, whose chief instruments were typewriters, telephones, and teletypes, were guiltier than those who actually operated the extermination machinery, threw the gas pellets into the chambers, manned the machine guns for the massacre of civilians, or were busy with the cremation of mountains of corpses. In the trial of Adolf Eichmann, desk murderer P.A.R. Excellence, the court declared that the degree of responsibility increases as we draw further away from the man who uses the fatal instruments with his own hands. Having followed the proceedings in Jerusalem, one was more than inclined to agree with this opinion. Point one. Complicity intrinsically requires the seemingly more bland compliance. To be complicit with some act is also to comply with the norms that govern the act, and with the laws or modes of life that its actors accept. However, the question immediately arises, when does an act of compliance with something ostensibly neutral or even good make me an accomplice to something that is wrong? And, further, when is it therefore ethically incumbent on me to resist compliance, to become a kind of Bart Levy figure, repeating the refrain that I would prefer not to in response to any request for engagement with the world, to in short, when should we resist the law of the land in order to rescue the ethical grounds on which law can reasonably be based? The issue can usefully be considered essentially under three headings, institutional complicities, political complicities, and ethical complicities. That arrangement allows us to arrive at a consideration of the relation of complic. ITY to personal responsibility. The route to this involves us in looking at how rules of engagement become laws, and how those laws depend, in turn. 20. Thomas Docherty. Upon the legitimization of a specific discourse or language game. Language itself, how we speak, how we write, the freedom of our speech and of an assembly of speakers in a community, plays a key role in understanding the workings of complicity. Institutional complicities, or the position of compliance offices. The function of institutional complicity is to make us do what we're told, essentially, within our institutions. All institutions work by having a set of internal rules or protocols. As in a game of football, say, there are certain moves within institutions that are permissible and others that are ruled out of order. So if I lift the ball in my hands, and assuming I am not the goalkeeper and standing within my own penalty box, then the game must stop because I have refused to comply with the rules. I will be penalized before the game can be restarted, and, if I repeat the offense against the rules, if I fail to comply, then, eventually, I will be evicted from the terrain, the field of play or the institution. Likewise, when our educational institutions establish protocols of behavior and conduct, we have to comply, or else the game stops temporarily while the breach of protocol is dealt with, and its agent eliminated from the game. We usually tacitly accept this, and it is this tacit acceptance that we use to ally call compliance. Management would regard it as essential to, even as the essence of, smooth operations of the organization or institution. Our everyday life beyond our institutions is also organized through such anthropologically ritualized compliances, and, at one deep level, this is simply the establishment of the bonds of trust and mutual confidence that allow our social order itself to function as it does. We would not usually refer to such trust as an act marked by complicity, unless we are of the view that what our institution and slash or society does and what it exists for is essentially nefarious, criminal and, in some way, fundamentally wrong. So, in institutional compliance, we are fundamentally agreeing not just with the ground rules of our institutions, we are also agreeing that they serve some good. This is important, compliance is not neutral, rather, it is an acknowledgement, if tacitly held, that we subscribe to the institution's aims. It is constitutive of a mutual confidence, of a bond that relates us to the institution, and the institution to a wider good that we wish to serve. The case of football was chosen not innocently, of course. As we know, at least as an apocryphal story, one day in 1823, William Webb Ellis of rugby school got fed up with the idea of avoiding hand contact with the ball. Point three to him, it seemed abundantly clear that, if the point of the game was to get complicity, law, responsibility 21. The ball between the opposing team's goalposts, then just using the feet or head was really a nuisance. It hampered the activity. So, he changed the rules, and set up a new regime, a new protocol, the game of rugby. In the logic of this story, Webb Ellis attacked the institution, he was a critic, and, in doing as he did, in his failure to comply, he was a kind of small-scale revolutionary. Writ large, of course, this can have serious consequences. What if Webb Ellis had questioned not just the rules of football, but also the rules of the institution within which the match took place that day? What if he failed to comply with the school's fundamental rules? What if he did as he did because he took the view that what the school itself, as an institution, stood for was misguided? If that were the case, what he would have realized is that compliance, with the rules of football, had slipped into complicity. With a social structure of education, and instead of just playing by the rules. He had become an accomplice to something with which he disagreed, something he saw as wrong. The rules of the game, he would have thought, had to change. Compliance, then, is not necessarily complicit with complicity, but it can become so, with serious consequences. Given the parallel I have made between the institution and society, we should extend this into a consideration of a particular institution, that of the law. In the rule of law, Tom Bingham, 
former Lord Chief Justice and Senior Law Lord of the United Kingdom, quotes Tony Blair from a press conference given on August 5, 2005, in the wake of the London 7-7's bombings, let no one be in any doubt, said Blair, the rules of the game are changing for what has followed this since 2005 is a series of new initiatives in anti-terrorist legislation. It's not just a game that is changing here, it is the law itself. This has caused difficulties in many ways, especially perhaps as it has impacted upon universities, and upon freedom of speech on campus. The question here is not just how have the rules changed, but also should we comply with the new rules. In what follows, I want to suggest that it is the government itself now, politics as such, that has become complicit with the very terrorist ideology from which it claims to be protecting us. Arthur Shaskalson, who had been a lawyer on the defense team in Nelson Mandela's Rivonia trial, and who later became the chief justice in post-apartheid South Africa between 2001 and 2005, pointed to the dilemma that the law faces when dealing with terrorism, terrorism, he writes, treats people as objects which can be eliminated in pursuit of a cause considered to be of greater importance than the lives of those who are targeted. It seeks to achieve its ends through fear and terror, denying the humanity of its victims. It poses a threat to democracy and needs to be combated. Hence the dilemma. The dilemma can be glossed quite straightforwardly, but the gloss raises a key question for the law as it tries to deal with the fact of terrorism. In a legitimate fashion, terrorism uses means that the law has rejected, that 22 Thomas Daugherty. The law will not and should not use. The question then is, how should law respond to terrorism consistently with its own values? How can this be done without undermining the foundations of a democratic legal system? 5. In recent times, many governments have dealt with this dilemma as entirely by making a determined choice to enact laws that may have the undesired effect of undermining democracy. That is to say, the laws thus brought about arise from an often undeclared state of emergency, and are not brought about by the usual roots of democratic discussion and the seeking of a mandate. The perceived urgency of the demand that we deal with terrorism leads to a legislation forged under conditions of emergency. Emergency legislation brings law into potential conflict with politics, it is as if two games are being played on the same field, and the political game wins over the legal game. However, the legal game then has to comply with, and indeed to realize, to endorse, and to enact the rules of the political game. Consequently, Bingham's rule of law cedes place to rule as such, to the rule of governmental politics. In this, the law is determined not by those who will be governed by it, rather, it is determined by those who will execute it, even if the government does not enjoy the confidence of those who are to be thus governed. The result is a conflict and paradox well described by Giorgio Agamben. Agamben writes that if the exceptional measures that characterize the state of emergency are the result of periods of political crisis, and if they for this very reason must be understood through the terrain of politics rather than through the legal or constitutional terrain, they find themselves in the paradoxical position of legal measures that cannot be understood from a legal point of view. The consequence of this, understood logically, is that the state of emergency presents itself as the legal form of that which can have no legal form. Point six. More simply, in this state of affairs, we have a complicity problem, and also a legitimacy problem. That which is legal may lack legitimacy, precisely because it has not been agreed or determined by a community, rather, the law is imposed regardless of whether it has achieved consent or whether its constitution is grounded in consensus, or even democratic participation, among those to be governed by it. It is a requirement of our membership of a community that we play by its rules, but here, our compliance with the polity requires that we suspend our usual participation in the determinations of the law, and the structure of our bond, our mutual confidence, is now explicitly imbalanced. At this point, we can say that compliance, an agreement to be bound by laws that we have ourselves determined as the rule of law, is verging on a coercive complicity. Otherwise put, if we are to remain on the right side of the law, we have to be complicit with whatever it is that the government determines as good, but it is government, not the legitimately established law. Complicity, law, responsibility 23. That rules. We then have a legitimacy that has shrunk to a mere legality, as Jurgen Habermas describes that condition in his legitimation crisis. 7. Bingham is clear on how the rule of law must operate. Citing the European Court of Human Rights, he states that the law must be adequately accessible, the citizen must be able to have an indication that is adequate in the circumstances of the legal rules applicable to a given case. That position seems eminently reasonable, and it follows from this that a norm cannot be regarded as a law unless it is formulated with sufficient precision to enable the citizen to regulate his conduct, he must be able, to foresee, to a degree that is reasonable in the circumstances, the consequences which a given action may entail. Point eight. The point of all this, for Bingham, is that the rule of law can be a rule, and can therefore demand our compliance, if and only if it operates against arbitrary decision-making. That's to say, there is no rule of law when a government, for example, makes it up as it goes along, in order to best suit its own prejudices, desires or judgments. Yet this is precisely what state of emergency legislation permits governments to do. That form of lawmaking also, necessarily, produces a democratic deficit, it is, of necessity, a law that is imposed from above, without waiting for legitimation through democratic argument, or governance by discussion as John Stuart Mill and Amar Yassen call it. It is also therefore intrinsically given to corruption, as it becomes law based on patronage, preference, or prejudice. What might it mean to be complicit with the law of the land, under conditions whereby the law of the land is itself such that it might threaten those very bonds of democracy that it is supposed to protect? What do we do when legitimate, 
democratically agreed rules shrink to a mere legalism imposed upon us from above. This is not just a moral question, what should I do? But also a structural one, how can the system of law itself survive its own? Deconstruction, its own lapse into illegitimacy. In less dramatic terms, we would recognize this in the university institution, for the classic example, as the question concerning academic freedom, the freedom that guarantees our ability to critique the rules of the game without fear of falling foul and being sent off. I'll return to some of these legal issues towards the end of this book, but let us first follow this further through the logic of academic freedom, since this will provide a structure for understanding complicity in a specific institutional framework. Political complicities, or the logic of diplomacy. Academic freedom is governed by a logic of independence. One can avoid being complicit with things that one sees as nefarious by asserting the freedom to dissent, to stand aside from the prevailing view and take a stand elsewhere. Point 9. 24. Thomas Docherty. The realization of academic freedom, typically, depends on the voicing of a dissenting position, it is linked to a freedom of speech, though different from that in some fundamentals. Point 10. However, such speech cannot be entirely divorced from rules or laws if it is to be heard. The exercising of free speech, as in academic freedom, is the establishing of a linguistic bond, and, in turn, this is constitutive of the making of a free assembly of speakers. That assembly establishes its identity by establishing its own rules, and here, that is a matter of voices, a word that is cognate with votes, as Shakespeare's Coriolanus knew all too well. Such an assembly, further, is free if and only if it avoids the imbalance between law and politics described by Agamben, and outlined in legal terms by Shaskalson. Shaskalson gave us a dilemma, laws designed to protect democratic societies from terror can end up undermining democracy. Paradoxically, they can strengthen and extend the very terror that they are supposed to contest. Agamben gives us the same issue in more philosophical terms, how do we avoid a state of affairs in which the law itself becomes politicized, thereby forgetting its supposed interest in just judgment, and instead serving the sovereign lawgiver who acts with impunity? This is not a condition unique to institutions. On the contrary, it permeates the social and political spheres, and has now also contaminated the private realm as well. Here is Shaskalson again, this time drawing parallels between the government in the 1950s South Africa and the recent Bush administration in the United States, post 9-11. The initial steps taken in South Africa in the 1950s laid the ground for further measures including the banning of the African National Congress, the Pan-African Congress and over time various other anti-apartheid organizations 98 in all, and the draconian security legislation of the 1960s and later years. People were brought on side with this through the deployment of linguistic maneuvering by the political classes, political rhetoric set the scene for this and for the legislation that followed. The white voters were warned that the state was facing a total onslaught. They were told that the legislation was not directed against law-abiding citizens and would not affect them. The targets were the communists and the terrorists. When this is done sufficiently thoroughly, complicity of a sort follows almost logically, the great majority of the white population remained silent and there was little opposition to the measures. Yet the consequences go well beyond what might have been foreseen, detention without trial was introduced, the police were empowered to hold detainees incommunicado, and to deny them access to their lawyers or their own medical advisors. Initially detention was for 90 days, then for 180 days, and then indefinitely. Courts were stripped of their jurisdiction to make habeas corpus orders in respect of detainees. The Isolation of the detainees and the ousting of the jurisdiction of the courts led to torture and other abuses 11. Complicity, Law, Responsibility 25. Shaskalson goes on to analyze the linguistic foundation of this, as an issue about who controls the language. He cites Mary Robinson, who has drawn attention to an alternative language that has been developed in the post-9-11 era, which has led to Orwellian euphemisms, coercive interrogation for torture, extraordinary rendition for kidnapping, etc. Shaskalson criticizes the UK legislation of 2006 criminalizing the glorification of terrorism and indirect incitement, and goes on to reveal what is the inevitable logical outcome of this. He writes, if cases arise the courts will no doubt give these words a meaning consistent with the underlying values of the law in this country. But legislation in such vague terms can have a chilling effect on the behavior of people. It is presumably intended to do so, for governments find it far better for people to silence themselves than to prosecute them. 12. This stifles debate and has what Shaskalson rightly identifies as a corrosive effect on our society. Can Joyce's famous recourse, to silence, exile, and cunning, have any purchase on this? One way of dealing with the difficulties here is precisely to suggest that I will avoid all forms of complicity with the existing social or political structures, I won't just pick up the ball in my hands, rather, I'll leave the field entirely and voluntarily. Like Melville's Bart Levy, I'll simply say I would prefer not to, or, like a latter-day version of Voltaire's Candide, I shall leave a big picture and will withdraw from the world to cultivate my private garden. The political issue as outlined by Shaskalson and Agamben is that there is now an increasingly unholy alliance and intimacy between politics and law, and, by extension, between governments and businesses that rely on the rule of law. Tarek Ali exposes what is at stake in his discussion of the extreme center. Our current political arrangements involve politicians who uphold a corpo. Rate power, which they rubber stamp in government by clique. This clique lives in what Ali calls a half-real, half-fake world of money, statistics, and focus groups. Their contact with real people, is minimal. They refuse to step down to talk to the people whose worlds they have destroyed. Further, in power they tend towards paranoia, 
treating any serious criticism as disloyalty. The diagnosis is bleak in this symbiosis between power and money, a symbiosis analyzed elsewhere in economic terms by Stiglitz and others. Point 13 For the beneficiaries of this state of affairs, complicity is required, and anything else, including criticism, is seen as disloyalty. Criticism must therefore be erased, and the voice of criticism goes unheard or is left talking to itself. Aristotle had long since analyzed the kinds of corruption of political conditions that lead to the perversion of the rule of law. For example, he endorsed the idea of monarchy, but saw how it could easily degenerate into tyranny. The difference is that, for Aristotle, a king considers his people first. 26 Thomas Docherty. While a tyrant is he who acts primarily in his own personal interests. A second example he offers is aristocracy, which can easily descend into timocracy and which is due to the corruption of ministers, who distribute the resources of the state without regard to merit, and keep all or most of the benefits for themselves, and confine public appointments to the same persons, because they pay most regard to wealth. Point 14 The result is that bad men hold power, he writes. The assertion of radical independence, made in the interests of avoiding complicity with these corruptions, is, paradoxically, what permits the corruption to happen. It does so because it has no strategy of solidarity and no language that can frame a new rule of law. It is language that is at the heart of this, voices are votes, so to speak. Political complicities have traditionally depended on alliances, affiliations, and solidarities. These, increasingly, are grounded in exclusions rather than inclusions. For Thatcher, is he one of us? For Bush, post 9-11, if you're not with us, you're against us. In both these cases, there was to be no ground for debate or dialogue, you either signed up or did not, or, either you were complicit with the project or you were an enemy of the project. This is the new form of class solidarity, and, crucially, it is based entirely on complicities, and not on compliance, on legality, or the politicization of the rule of law, and not legitimacy. There is no longer any room for debate or dialogue or contestation of views. That's to say, the lawgiver, the tyrant, the timocrat, requires total adherence to the law, but to the law that is determined by them and for their interests. These political complicities are based on regimes of language, to exert a material influence, one has to speak the dominant language of the tribe, one has to echo the word, as it were, the language of one of us, the language of the war on terror, the language of business, entrepreneurship, leader. Ship, best practice, targets, benchmarks, excellence, world leading, content. Providers, vision statements, strategies, and all the rest of our contemporary jargon of management and of performance and improvement. As I have argued elsewhere, Managerialist fundamentalism now determines what can be said and thought, 15 and the logic is that, if one's voice is to be heard, if one's vote is to count, then one has to be the monkey channeling the voice and realizing the will of the boss or monkey grinder. In other words, you can speak, you can even speak out, but you are still silenced, because if the words you utter are to be heard, they must be the words of someone else, the words of the boss. Patronage now becomes the new law. In this state of affairs, the dissenting voice is seen as illegitimate, and therefore is either silenced or rendered structurally inaudible, precisely because it does not speak the dominant language. This is tantamount to saying that protest is criminalized, and we have seen this exemplified throughout our societies. In the university, it means that the dissenting voice must be disciplined, you can speak, but you'll lose your job. Critique is thus discarded. Complicity, law, responsibility 27. Ethical complicities, or, towards responsibility. Complicity, considered now in these linguistic terms, is constructed through the establishment of a reduced lexicon, the change in the language is actually a reduction of the lexicon available for discussion and debate. It leads to the assertion that the existing conditions in which we live constitute something called reality, and it rests on the assumption that the existing dominant language captures and represents that reality perfectly. It follows that any other language is inherently idealistic or, as it is usually said, simply unrealistic. We are asked to be complicit with Tina, with the coercive language that states baldly that there is no alternative. As Roberto Mangabira Unger has argued, however, in these terms, being realistic essentially means accepting the world as it is. It therefore requires a political endorsement of things as they are. Such political complicity really means being complicit with an idea that the world cannot be changed by my actions, and thus I become complicit with the refusal to accept responsibility for trying to change a bad situation. It is a position that abnegates responsibility, through quietism, which is the political correlative of silence. One striking political phenomenon in recent times, usually cast as a liberal good, is the historical apology, unable or unwilling to address contemporary problems, we apologize for past bad acts, and distance our present selves and constitutions from them. For example, we apologize for slavery, for the Irish famine, for misogynist crimes and so on. This is a move beyond Condit or Bart Levy, we acknowledge our collective guilt, or our structural complicity with actions that we, ourselves, did not commit. As Arendt has shown, however, the act of taking such guilt upon ourselves, acknowledging a complicity with a past act that was actually carried out by individuals other than ourselves, is not necessarily a good thing. In post-war Germany, she points out, the cry we are all guilty that at first hearing, Sounded so very noble and tempting has actually only served to exculpate to a considerable degree those who actually were guilty. Where all are guilty, nobody is. Guilt, 
unlike responsibility, always singles out, it is strictly personal 16 in fact, she goes further, to claim that in our case of collective guilt feelings this would mean that the cry we are all guilty is actually a declaration of solidarity with the wrongdoers.17 the bond that we make with the past in this way is actually a means of avoiding our bonds with and responsibilities to the present. Errant is clear, however, unlike responsibility, guilt is that which singles the individual out from any collective, and this returns us to our court of law. She writes, in a courtroom there is no system on trial, no history or historical trend, no ism, anti-Semitism for instance, but a person, and if the defendant happens to be a functionary, he stands accused precisely because even a functionary is still a human being, and it is in this capacity that he stands trial 18. 28 Thomas Docherty. For Arendt, complicity is always political. In my terms here, what this means is that politics is that which erases the possibility of compliance, of community, in an act in which politics supersedes legitimacy. Better put, complicity is what happens when legitimacy shrinks to legality, when the possibility of compliance, or collective responsibility, is reduced to our HAV to be complicit with our superiors in a hierarchical and undemocratic society. In this latter case, we lose not just independence but also our voice. How, then, to engage the world when we live in a state of affairs where every resisting of the evil done in the world necessarily entails some implication in evil, 19 How to avoid complicity with this? Arendt's answer, fundamentally, is that we should shift the question of collective responsibility to the question of individual guilt, that is, she argues for a rule of law, especially in the face of the bureaucracy of any system. She reverts to the Nazi war crimes trials to elucidate the point. One of the defenses advanced by the criminals was that they were necessarily just a cog in a larger system, where each cog, that is, each person, must be expendable without changing the system, an assumption underling all bureaucracies. Point 20 from this, it followed that the question of the personal responsibility of those who run the whole affair is a marginal issue. Here it is indeed true what all the defendants in the post-war trials said to excuse themselves, if I had not done it, somebody else could and would have 21 paradoxically, the criminal exculpates himself here by saying that, in committing the murders, he is actually saving someone else from having to do it. This is why, for Arendt, bureaucracy unhappily is the rule of nobody and for this very reason perhaps the least human and most cruel form of rulership. She continues, but in the courtroom, these definitions are of no avail 22 because the whole point of the courtroom, of the law, is to individuate, in order to ascribe guilt or innocence. She considers Bartleby-style non-participation, especially in the light of this paradoxical mode of self-defense for the bureaucratic Nazi criminal. It may be the case, she argues, that individuals elect to be free from politics, and to take no part in its workings. This is carried to a logical extreme in totalitarianism. The distinction made here is that such non-participation might be politically positive under a dictatorship, what if everyone refuses to comply, but that it is of no use in totalitarian societies. The difference is that, in totalitarian societies, the dominant language, as it were, permeates every aspect of life such that no other language, thought or mode of life is possible. There can be no private realm, no Voltarian garden, into which one might withdraw. For errant, totalitarian society, as distinguished from totalitarian government, is indeed monolithic, all public manifestations, cull, tural, artistic, or learned, and all organizations, welfare, and social services. Even sports and entertainment, are coordinated. The system infiltrates. Complicity, law, responsibility 29. Everything, there is no office and indeed no job of any public significance, from advertising agencies to the judiciary, from play acting to sports journalism, from primary and secondary schooling to the universities and learned societies, in which an unequivocal acceptance of the ruling principles is not demanded. 23 Might we say this precisely of our own societies? It is surely the case, as André Gortz and Pierre Levy have both argued, that the norms of neoliberal capital have subsumed everything in our time. It is difficult to get an audience for any view that contests the idea that everything is a business, that everything is commerce, and that even the very self is an entrepreneurial project, such, at least, is the neoliberal vision of the future of work, the abolition of salaried employment, generalist self-entrepreneurship, the subsumption of the whole person and the whole of life by capital, with which everyone identity fees entirely. Now, then, everything becomes a commodity. Selling oneself extends to all aspects of life. Everything is measured in money 24 If this is the case, then, whoever participates in public life at all, regardless of party membership in the elite formations of the regime, is implicated in one way or another in the deeds of the regime as a whole 25 Collaboration, complicity, with such regimes is often described as the lesser of two evils, but politically, the weakness of the argument has always been that those who choose the lesser evil forget very quickly that they chose. Evil point 26 This is why the question of complicity is, in the final analysis, a question of ethics and of personal responsibility. This brings us to my final point in this book, which relates to the logic of incrementalism, of incremental small changes in our institutions, our laws, and our politics, in short, in our innermost conditions of living and of selfhood. In incrementalism, what happens is that we are faced with a series of small and niggling socio-political or institutional changes. None of these is in itself very significant, in the jargon, we should choose our fights. Yet, what happens if we comply with all these small changes? Aaron tells us, and gives us an extremely salutary warning, acceptance of lesser evils, she says, 
is consciously used in conditioning the government officials as well as the population at large to the acceptance of evil as such 27 we sigh, we get used to it, but over time, we wonder, how did we get here from there? And here is a salutary example, to give but one among many examples, the extermination of Jews was preceded by a very gradual sequence of anti-Jewish measures, each of which was accepted with the argument that refusal to cooperate would make things worse, until a stage was reached where nothing worse could possibly have happened. 28 For a more contemporary version of these questions, we can consult Dave Eggers' novel The Circle. The Circle is an organization that incrementally begins to control every aspect of an individual's life. It begins innocently and 30 Thomas Docherty. Helpfully enough, the Circle develops an algorithm and a web platform called TrueU. This helps coordinate all those pesky passwords that you need to remember for all the websites that you visit and through which, increasingly, your life has to be organized, bank account, workplace identification, different passwords for all the department stores or other sites from which you buy online, social networking sites, blogging sites, and so on. It is a great success, like Facebook or Google, it starts to assume a massive importance, and people increasingly have to use TrueU if they want to be a functioning part of everyday society. The circle does not stop there. Incrementally, through the development of other algorithms that allow the circle to monitor the activities of its users, via TrueU, it begins to develop a culture of total transparency. It develops micro cameras that can be placed, again helpfully, to let users see weather conditions on a beach where they want to surf that afternoon, or to keep an eye on infirm parents while away from home, or to help reduce crime. The camera apparatus for this, sea change, quickly proliferates, and we come close to a society of total visual surveillance, a society where, in the words of one of the wise men of the circle, all that happens must be known. That uppercase slogan is just one of many that operates, Orwellian 1984 style, to dominate and to shape the lives of everyone. Increasingly, in order to exist not just as a circle employee but also as a citizen, everyone must participate in the world that is shaped by the circle. In the end, this becomes a menacing condition as the circle approaches compulsion, when it develops democracy, the new web-based version of democracy. It is a totalitarian nightmare, in which private life has been completely coloradonized by the circle, and in which all that happens must be known, where Privacy is theft since it deprives the world of whatever it is that people are keeping private, where secrets are lies, and sharing is caring. The circle takes to its logical conclusion the power of technology to force entire populations into complicity with mathematically computed algorithms that delimit the possibilities of human relationships while pretending to enhance those very relationships. It gives a dystopian account of a world in which all is shared, and in which everyone must participate all the time. It takes participatory democracy to a point where it becomes life-stifling, in which all communities exist only via a web interface, and where there can be no actual material engagement of individuals with each other. It is where the culture of authenticity, aligned with technological advance, is taking us, and it makes us complicit, necessarily, and despite our best intentions, with totalitarianism. The circle is a fiction, but it is one that barely conceals the technological and corporate realities that shape our contemporary predicaments. It is a fiction that reveals the real and historical complicity, law, Responsibility 31. Conclusion. There can be only one conclusion from this, and it lies in the words responsibility and resistance. Each small change, be it institutional, political, or ethical, must be seen in terms of a larger ideological picture, and its direction of travel needs to be analyzed and, where necessary, resisted. We resist by speaking out, but speaking out to our enemies as much as to our friends, this is otherwise known as argument and persuasion. In some cases, it is called education. Crucially, it has to be done directly, face to face, with all the ethical demands that this entails. Point 29 Our primary responsibility, further, is not to the guilt and crimes of the past but rather to the possibilities of the future, and to the inventions, therefore, of new languages. This does not mean that we forget the past, rather, that we see it, too, in terms of that larger ideological picture. In Remnants of Auschwitz, Agamben writes, in every age, the gesture of assuming a juridical responsibility when one is innocent has been considered noble, the assumption of political or moral responsibility without the assumption of the COR responding legal consequences, on the other hand, has always characterized the arrogance of the mighty 30 today, he argues, the contrite assumption of moral responsibility is invoked at every occasion as an exemption from the responsibilities demanded by law. That is to say, individuals guilty of criminal behavior apologize for their errors, their mistakes their own moral shortcomings. They should be facing the force of law, as individuals in courts, but the tacit assumption of moral guilt attempts to compensate for legal guilt. 31 You and I commit a crime, the boss says, I did something foolish. I've been an idiot. You and I go to jail, the boss goes on to some TV confessional shows and becomes a celebrity. Ethics is what calls us to an assumption of responsibility, but it also calls for us to establish new modes of assembly, new forms of speech, and, for that, we need, still, a new language. That is probably why poetry matters. We might therefore look to the past to update the present here, and quote Marx, the social revolution of the 19th century cannot draw its poetry from the past, but only from the future. 32. Notes. 1. Hannah Arendt, Responsibility and Judgment, ed. Jerome Cohn, New York, Skokken Books, 2003, 241. 2. C. Herman Melville, Bart Levy the Scribner, 
in Billy Budd and Other Stories, ed. Harold Beaver, London, Penguin, 1986. 32 Thomas Docherty. 3 For an interesting gloss on the apocryphal story, see the resources at http colon slash slash www.rugbyfootballistory.com slash webls.html www.rugbyfootballistory.com slash webls.html. 4 Tom Bingham, The Rule of Law, London, Penguin, 2011, 136. 5 Arthur Sheskalson, The Widening Gyre, Counterterrorism, Human Rights, and the Rule of Law, Cambridge Law Journal 67, 2008 2 The title of the article refers to a poem by Yeats, The Second Coming, Warning of the Coming of Anarchy, Turning and Turning in the Widening Gyre slash The Falcon Cannot Hear the Falconer, slash Things Fall Apart, The Center Cannot Hold, slash Mere Anarchy is Loosed Upon the World. 6 C. Giorgio Agamben, The State of Emergency, Generation Online, Access June 27, 2016, HTTP slash slash www.generationonline.org slash p slash bagambenschmidt.htm HTTP slash slash www.generationonline.org slash p slash bagambenschmidt.htm 7. C. Jurgen Habermas, Legitimation Crisis, Trans. Thomas McCarthy, London. Heinemann, 1976, where we can see the emergence of what we now think of tech. Nocratic government, government which is constituted legally but whose activity is reduced to management instead of representation, precisely because it makes no call upon legitimacy to underpin its legality. 8. Bingham, Rule of Law, 39. 9. The parallel to academic freedoms guarantees in other walks of life, in institutions or organizations that are more distanced from public engagement, would possibly be whistleblowing legislation. 10. See the essays collected in Lewis Menand, ed., The Future of Academic Free D.O.M., Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1998, including especially the essay by Henry Louis Gates, Jr., Critical Race Theory and Freedom of Speech, for some of the niceties and nuances involved in the distinction. See also, more recently, Stanley Fish, Versions of Academic Freedom, Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 2015, to be read alongside his earlier There's No Such Thing as Free Speech, New York, Oxford University Press, 1994. 11. Chaskalson, Widening Gyre, 74. 12. Ibid, 75 and 76. 13. Tarek Alley, The Extreme Center, London, Verso, 2015, 3 to 4. See also Joseph Stiglitz, The Great Divide, New York, Norton, 2015, and Joseph Stiglitz, The Price of Inequality, New York, Norton, 2012. 14. Aristotle, Ethics, Trans. J.A.K. Thompson, London, Penguin, 2004, 275. 15. C. Thomas Docherty, Thomas Docherty on Academic Freedom, in Times Higher Education, December 4, 2014, Access June 27, 2016, https slash slash www.timeshy slash slash www.timeshyereducation.com slash features slash thomas hyphen docherty hyphen on hyphen academic hyphen freedom slash 2017268.article ereducation.com slash features slash thomas hyphen docherty hyphen on hyphen academic hyphen freedom slash 2017268.article 16 errant responsibility and judgment 147 17 ibid 148 18 ibid 30 19 ibid 152 20 ibid 29. 21 Ibid. 22 Ibid. 31. 23 Ibid. 33. Dave Eggers has produced a dystopian version of such a society in his recent novel, The Circle, London, Penguin, 2014, which is briefly addressed later in the chapter. Complicity, Law, Responsibility 33. 24 Andre Gortz, The Immaterial, Trans. Chris Turner, Kolkata and Chicago, Seagull Books, 2010, 23 and 24, and C.F. Armando Iannucci, Politics was once about beliefs and society. Now it's a worship of money, Observer, March 8, 2015, Access June 27, 2016, HTTPS slash slash www.theguardian.com slash comment is free slash 2015 slash mar slash 08 slash HTTPS slash slash www.theguardian.com slash comment is free slash 2015 slash mar slash 08 slash Armando Armando Iannucci Money at Heart of Politics General Election 2015. 25 Errant, Responsibility, 33. 26 Abid. 36. 27 Ibid, 36 to 7. 28 Ibid, 37. 29 It follows, of course, that the MOOC is anathema to education, although it is certainly not anathema to the EDU business that sees education as a cash cow to be milked for private profit. 30 Giorgio Agamben, Remnants of Auschwitz, Trans. Daniel Heller Rosen, New York, Zone Books, 2002, 23 to 4. 31 Ibid, 24. 32 Karl Marx, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, Peking, Foreign Languages Press, 1978, 13. Bibliography. Agamben, Giorgio. Remnants of Auschwitz. Translated by Daniel Heller Rosen. New York, Zone Books, 2002. Agamben, Giorgio. The State of Emergency. 
Generation Online. Access June 27, 2016. HTTP slash slash www.generationonline.org slash p slash HTTP slash slash www.generationonline.org slash p slash fagambenschmidt.htm. Ali, Tarek. The Extreme Center London, Verso, 2015. Arendt, Hannah. Responsibility and Judgment. Edited by Jerome Cohn. Skokken Books, New York, 2003. Aristotle. Ethics. Translated by J.A.K. Thompson. London, Penguin. 2004. Bingham, Tom. The Rule of Law. London, Penguin, 2011. Shaskalson, Arthur. The Widening Gyre, Counterterrorism, Human Rights, and the Rule of Law. Cambridge Law Journal 67, 2008 69-91. Daugherty, Thomas. Thomas Daugherty on Academic Freedom. In Times Higher Education, December 4, 2014. Access June 27, 2016. HTTPS slash slash www dot times high slash slash www dot times high er education dot com slash features slash Thomas hyphen dot hyphen on hyphen academic hyphen freedom slash two zero one seven two six eight dot article er education dot com slash features slash Thomas hyphen dot hyphen on hyphen academic hyphen freedom slash two zero one seven two six eight dot article Eggers, Dave The Circle London, Penguin, two thousand and fourteen Fish, Stanley There's no such thing as free speech New York Oxford University Press, 1994. Fish, Stanley. Versions of Academic Freedom. Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 2015. Gates, Jr., Henry Lewis. Critical Race Theory and Freedom of Speech. In the Future of Academic Freedom. Edited by Lewis Menand. Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1998. Gortz, Andre. The Immaterial. Translated by Chris Turner. Kolkata and Chicago, Seagull Books, 2010. 34 Thomas Daugherty. Habermas, Jurgen. Legitimation Crisis. Translated by Thomas McCarthy. London, Heinemann, 1976. Iannucci, Armando. Politics was once about beliefs and society. Now it's a warship of money. Observer, March 8, 2015. Access June 27, 2016. HTTPS slash slash www HTTPS slash slash www. TheGuardian.com slash comment is free slash 2015 slash mar slash 08 slash Armando hyphen Iannucci money at heart of politics general election 2015. Marx, Carl. The 18th premier of Louis Bonaparte. Peking, Foreign Languages Press, 1978. Melville, Herman. Bart Levy the Scrivener. In Billy Butt and Other Stories. Edited by Harold Beaver. London, Penguin, 1986. Menand, Louis, ed. The Future of Academic Freedom. 35. Chapter 3. Complicity as Political Rhetoric. Some Ethical and Political Reflections. Paul Reynolds. In this chapter I show the value of complicity as a rhetorical tool. Point one much of the discussion of complicity either engages with it philosophically as a concept that has particular meaning and power in its deployment, or deploys it in concrete cases of alleged complicity. The underlying logic to such approaches is that complicity as a concept provides a particular and useful explanatory value in its deployment. The task of the critic therefore, is an analytical one, to establish the precise meaning of the concept in order to use it effectively. Complicity is used as a concept to describe a relationship or association that may not involve direct responsibility for particular events or developments but is nevertheless of significance. Think, for instance, of the complicity of the British government and intelligence agencies in the US rendition and torture of terrorist suspects during the Afghan and Iraq wars, see Finn in this book, or the complicity of a wide range of property and financial speculators and governmental regulatory agencies in bringing forth the financial crash of 2007 to 2008. The power in claims of complicity, I argue, is in its everyday usage, evoking participation in and degrees of responsibility for an act even if direct and criminal culpability is difficult to attribute. To be complicit, to use vernacular language, is to be tarred with the brush of blame. Recognizing this power of complicity in use, I want to argue that complex ITY is of limited value in terms of terminological exactitude. Philosophers who seek to clarify its use as a means to clarify its attribution and assess the validity of complicity claims have somewhat limited results. Nevertheless, complicity still has value. Its value is in political rhetoric. The power of complicity lies in the construction of a political narrative able to highlight the blurred lines of culpability, liability, and responsibility in dealing with often complex events and social practices. This chapter traces several demon zions of complicity in order to demonstrate both the problem of conceptual. 36 Paul Reynolds exactitude in claims of complicity, and the power of complicity as a rhetorical tool. In so doing, it also suggests that the concept of complicity is of critical importance in constructing political narratives that focus attention not only on who is, and who is not to blame, important as that can be, 
but also on structural conditions within capitalist heteropatriarchal imperialist and prejudiced societies that produce and reproduce conditions in which people are, and sometimes can't help but be, complicit in the continued presence of racism, ethnic othering and Islamophobia, class divisions, economic inequalities, and poverty. Point two. Decoding complicity. When considering how to understand complicity, we should bear in mind Wittgenstein's exhortation concerning family resemblances, or likenesses, in the use of language. Point three. Wittgenstein, in speaking of language games, observes that the sense of language is inseparable from the cultural conventions and practices that govern accepted linguistic practices in historical contexts and conjunctures. The rules of the game. Point four. A word's meaning does not stem from a singular and definitive definition that can be analytically extracted from the game within which it is deployed. Moreover, the meaning of a term in its deployment will always be contextually contingent. Hence rather than a direct association with a phenomena or object, concepts are only given meaning in a language game, where the referents are often other, equally slippery, concepts. As such, concepts can never be easily and specifically applied. And often the boundaries between one concept and another, complicity or collusion, for instance, in the making of explanations of phenomena are contingent and contestable rather than rigorously singular against a universal meaning. This understanding of the use of concepts encourages moves away from understanding language as precise and universal. Instead, it encourages both genealogical tracings of a concept's meaning in particular contexts and attempts to understand a concept's discursive power. On this account, the meaning of the concept of complicity will always be subject to the language games within which it is used. How complicity is used to attribute fault to a person, group, or people will depend on the concepts used in particular linguistic practices. Moreover, the meaning of concepts can only be clarified by the use of other, often synonymous, concepts. With this in mind, to be complicit might also be to be liable for, responsible for, or to have colluded in or supported certain practices. This approach to language leads to a more circumspect understanding of what happens when a concept is used. We all know what complicity means when we are asked. We can all illustrate it with particular examples. We can. Complicity as political rhetoric 37. Even try to define it. Oxford Dictionaries Online offers a typical definition, the fact or condition of being involved with others in an activity that is unlawful or morally wrong. Point five. But what does this definition tell us? As soon as we begin to instantiate it and explore it through examples, the concept becomes contested and elusive. As soon as we make a claim of complicity, we encounter disagreement about what complicity means and about whether it is legitimately applied. In trying to characterize complicity, we draw from the family of concepts it sits within, collusion, culpability, compliance, connivance, abetment, involvement, implication, and responsibility, among others. Yet each term describes the character of a relationship slightly different to complicity. Language has a metaphorical and rhetorical character and complicity or one of its family of concepts is often used if it appears to evoke powerful responses, rather than from a sense of precision. This makes it even more difficult to conceive of complicity as having a distinct meaning that we can deploy. Point six, if we look for attempts to describe complicity, in the United Kingdom the Law Commission has provided an extensive outline of what might be regarded as complicit behavior in reviewing secondary liability and joint enterprise in the committing of a crime. Its conclusion is that at the core of the doctrine of secondary liability is the notion that D can and should be convict of the offense that P commits even though D has only aided, abetted, counseled, or procured P to commit the offense. Point seven. Yet it also recognizes that complicity is rooted in flexible and ill-defined common law and so concentrates on developing more specific definitions of joint enterprise and secondary liability rather than refining complicity. Similarly, U.S. law approaches complicity from the point of view of identifying an accomplice not only by their aiding and abetting, but also by their counseling, commanding, in core aging, inducing, procuring, or assisting others in the commission of a crime. Point eight, the purpose of law is to establish legal accountability and liability so that particular parties can resolve legal disputes, such as criminal conviction or recognition of liability through criminal or civil, and financial, redress. The use of complicity outside of the legal language game is rarely as narrow or specific. Yet if a term is to be useful, it must have some specificity. If we look to how philosophers have explored the concept of complicity, it has been to describe the problem of marginal contributions to a particular action. Here, a largely analytical approach has sought to make a distinction, based upon measurements of shared intention, between who cannot be regarded as complicit and therefore liable on the one hand, and who cannot be held liable on the basis that their association is less direct. This analytical approach is underpinned by a methodological individualism, and claims that complicity is based on an act of doing or an act of omission on the one hand, and an individual self-interest in the immediate action and end consequences on. 38. Paul Reynolds. The other point nine much is made of shared intention, where intentionality can be directed at intermediate goals and a final event or goal, something Cuts refers to as inclusive authorship of an eventual act. Point ten, for example, people who receive stolen goods take no part in the crime of theft, but are regarded as having a shared intention by virtue of their deriving benefit from receiving the goods while knowing or suspecting that they were stolen. These conceptual pictures are of importance in determining nominal forms of accountability and responsibility, whether legally, morally or politically. In the above legal and philosophical examples, the concept of complicity is used in order to characterize, from an analytic point of view, a relationship or association that enables the attribution of blame, identifies measures of redress and establishes precedents for future attributions of blame and measures of redress. This chapter focuses on a different use of the concept of complicity. 
it does so for three reasons. First, useful as they are for the purposes of pragmatism in justifying action, these uses operate within an analytical paradigm where the core concepts, such as intentionality, are clearly delineated for the purpose of developing rigorous chains of reasoning. I have already challenged such a paradigm using the notion of language games, and in what follows, I suggest that the problem with complicity is that it remains conceptually slippery. Second, they attribute to complicity an analytical precision and clarity, when the argument I will pursue will be that we should properly see complicity, in contrast, as a tool of rhetoric. Third, I am concerned in particular with the use of complicity in political contexts and in political critique. In what follows, I will use different examples to draw out some of the nuances and virtues of rhetorical uses of the concept of complicity. Political uses of complicity seek to characterize and condemn particular relationships, associations, events, and phenomena. Goldhagen, for example, claims a widespread complicity of the German people in the persecution of Jews by Hitler's Nazi government in the 1930s and 1940s. Point eleven. The measure of this complicity in the Holocaust is contested. Members of the Staffel, SS, and senior Nazi figures would be commonly understood to have had direct responsibility. But were the police or the soldiers of the Wehrmacht complicit by virtue of the way in which they enforced Nazi politics and policies? Were concentration camp guards or those who worked in the camps administratively complicit in genocide? Were support workers within the bureaucracy supporting the German war machine and the Nazi killing machine complicit? Were Germans who were aware of the persecution of Jews and their dispossession and disappearance complicit, whether they actively gained from it or not? Were Germans who had some cognizance of Nazi politics and the persecution of the Jews but simply did not want to know or think about it complicit? The purpose of these questions is not to settle complicity as political rhetoric 39. Whether one should argue, with Goldhagen, for a widespread complicity, or argue against it as Finkelstein does. Instead, it is to suggest that the degree to which particular people were complicit is a matter of political contestation, not analytical precision or historical interpretation. Point 12 So far, this chapter has suggested that the virtue of the concept of complex ity is its political and rhetorical use, rather than its analytical precision. What can be said about complicity in its meaningful and convincing rhetorical use? We can note that complicity is almost always used to characterize a negative association, for a contrasting use, see Leitman's chapter in this book. That is to say, it is often used as one of a number of attributions that evoke involvement with a negative act. It is rarely ascribed to a positive act, where words like involvement, collaboration, and support seem more suitable. To be held to be complicit in some action is normally seen as an indictment, and to attribute complicity is also to attribute blame. Complicity can be found in actions, or arguably situations in which we fail to act when we should have, and slash or in a relationship that we are in, voluntarily or otherwise. Two examples will suffice. We might see complicity in joining in with or showing approval for the bullying of someone on the basis of their sexuality, disability, gender, ethnicity, or class in the workplace or classroom, even if there is no direct communication between those who are primarily orchestrating the bullying and those who then join in or repeat the behavior. Complicity might be extended to characterize participation in making a particular environment one in which bullying is normalized. In addition, it might also be claimed that standing aside when observing the bullying, not intervening appropriately, either directly or indirectly, depending on, for example, imminent threats of violence if direct intervention takes place, also renders one complicit. Moreover, not acting to support the person being bullied might signify complicity in the bullying. Clearly those who start from a position of requiring clear intentions and volition might argue that this is stretching the term too far, but then they are challenged by arguments highlighting the numerous cases where people have had it in their agency to halt a state of affairs, and in not doing so have to accept an element of responsibility. There might be an argument about degrees of complicity between the different relationships to bullying that are sketched, but our concern here is that complicity can be used, however contentiously, to describe all of those relationships. It is therefore the persuasiveness of the particular narrative through which we make claims of someone's complicity, and not the forensic line drawn between complicity and non-complicity, that is important. A second example is political. In a representative democracy, if I vote for a conservative government in the United Kingdom in order to benefit from low taxes, am I complicit in the impoverishment of the poor and the vulnerable? 40. Paul Reynolds. That follows from limited budgets or cuts in public spending. When choosing to vote, voters receive or can access information on the likely effects of particular tax regimes on both themselves and others. Whether their motives are personal financial gain or broader, ideological convictions concerning the perceived public good or just nature of a small state, the consequence of their vote is to enable political measures that impoverish the poor and the vulnerable. In response to criticism, voters might claim that they voted for lower taxes but could not anticipate or did not know what the consequences would be. But how far should that claim of knowledge be permitted to stand as a justifiable explanation? In an age in which political debate saturates the media, especially during election times, is it legitimate to claim we are not complicit due to lack of information or knowledge? Of course, the information avail. Able is often articulated with bias and is incomplete, but there is often suf. Facient knowledge to reasonably make some forms of critical judgment. One of the biggest difficulties here is whether willful or culpable ignorance and reckless indifference constitute complicity. If they do, this observation would cause considerable difficulty to analytical accounts of complicity that focus on shared intentions, actions, or volitions. 
Culpable ignorance as complicity is an excellent example of an accusation of complicity that would be difficult to account for within a fixed, analytic definition, but can be potently woven into a political narrative. This second example is less straightforward than the first. Liberal Democrat voters in the UK general election of 2010 voted for a manifesto that rejected university tuition fees. They could claim that then-party leader Nick Clegg misled them insofar as he decided prior to the election that he would not stick to his anti-austerity promises, including promises not to raise uni. Versity tuition fees, in the event of involvement in a coalition government. In this case, arguments about complicity are complicated by broader cases of political representation, and the relationship between mandated or independent representation in politics. Point 13 Both examples point to the contested and malleable use of complicity and the question, pursued below, of agency and structure in the attribution of complicity. It might further be claimed that the second example problematizes the relationship between knowledge and action. It might also be argued that even where deceit has taken place, there is the question of what should be known and what is known. In a democratic polity where promises are frequently broken or truth stretched, to what extent does complicity arise from our failure to learn from these broken promises and to continue to take claims at face value because it is more convenient for us to do so? In the case of the Liberal Democrats, the ardent claims that policy concerning tuition fees was inviolate would suggest that voters were not complicit but deceived. Yet it could equally be claimed that by entertaining coalition as a possibility. Complicity as political rhetoric 41. And then not leaving the party or directly opposing the policy change and the people who enacted it, many party members were complicit. Culpability Y becomes a movable feast, largely based on judgments concerning what might reasonably be assumed to be being knowledgeable about elections, party promises and subsequent political action. These examples demonstrate, on the one hand, that complicity is too slippery for analytical use. On the other, they show that complicity is powerful as a rhetorical device. Invoking complicity enables one to make meaningful connections between particular people or groups and their involvement in events, actions, and processes that are being criticized. It has currency in the political language games that we play. Interesting questions, then, surround the limits to the persuasive use of complicity, and not in its precise analytical definition. These questions can only be addressed through focusing on complicity through particular examples. They cannot be solved through a focus on its abstract conceptual form. Indeed, even one of the seemingly fundamental features of complicity, its negative connotations, stems from its rhetorical value, and not from its analytical precision. It is because it has use in placing blame at the hands of those named complicit that it is used to connote something negative. While complicity can only be understood in terms of its persuasive use within language games, there are nonetheless dimensions that shape the kind of claims about complicity that can convincingly be made. This chapter now turns to these dimensions, focusing first on agency and structure, then on imminence and distance, before finally turning to normal states and states of exception. Agency and structure. The associations and relationships in which one might be complicit can be measured in terms of different degrees of agency and structure. Agency and structure are important when accusations of complicity start by ascribing complicity to an individual, and begin with structural critique. Complicity can be easily ascribed to particular individuals or groups where direct agency has been exercised, or when an individual or group benefit from something when they know or ought to know that a morally unacceptable cost has been paid elsewhere. Buying stolen goods provides an example here. If I buy stolen goods because I am in dire poverty, I may be deemed less complicit for two reasons. First, I may be buying the goods to meet basic subsistence and need, and hence may have less meaningful choice as to whether or not to steal. Second, in poor communities, buying stolen goods might be a common or necessary practice that most people engage in, making. 42 Paul Reynolds. It's harder to attribute responsibility to the individual. If I buy stolen goods as an individual in an affluent community, by contrast, I have a clear choice to do otherwise, and I am more likely to be violating social norms. As a result, I would be deemed complicit to a greater degree. This example suggests that complicity is often attributed based on degrees of choice, and claims of complicity become less persuasive in situations where individuals are, to a greater extent, structurally determined in their actions. Alternatively, judgments of complicity can begin with structural analyses of the topography of social associations. From this angle, complicity can result from an agent being part of a complex social formation in which some systematically benefit at the cost of others. Here, claims of complicity work in two ways. First, they can enable a wider social critique by highlighting the nature of wider structural forces that encourage or force the individual to be complicit. Second, they can provide a room for the attribution of individual agency within structural forms of domination. An individual can be complicit in structural forms of domination, even if he or she is not singularly responsible for it or singularly able to overturn it. As a result, there are forms of action short of social revolution that can enable individuals to become less complicit or anti-complicit. The use of complicity as a lens for wider social critique is particularly important given the complexity of contemporary societies. It may be difficult to establish clear lines of causality between an individual's action and the reproduction or legitimation of exploitative social relations. Moreover, the complexity of these associations may mean that individuals are not aware of their role in reproducing or legitimizing relations of domination. This complexity may also mean that their ignorance is not culpable. Point 14 The hegemonic and ideological power and coercive apparatus of the state and powerful interests, or class factions, might justify not holding people to account even if they experience some benefit and others experience some cost. 
If complicity could not be used as a lens for structural social critique, it would risk becoming less useful as a rhetorical device in complex societies. Instead, by starting with stories of how individuals have little choice but to participate within problematic social relations, one can use complicity as a lens through which to critique structural forms of domination. This use of complicity can be illustrated through the example of consumption in affluent societies. Those conspicuous consumers who consume for the pleasure and status of ownership and consumption could be accused of being complicit in reproducing a capitalist economy that enables them to benefit from the low cost of goods that is made possible by the exploitation of labor. Point 15 This accusation becomes problematic, though, in light of a structural analysis suggesting that consumers are seduced by forms of media and advertising that reinforce the values and practices of a consumer. Complicity as political rhetoric 43. Society.16 Such an analysis would suggest that such consumers are not solely responsible for their consumption, and the responsibility is shared with structural forms of determination. This is a central issue for Marxist and other radical critiques of contemporary capitalist societies. To what extent should people be responsible for the social relations they occupy and perform, and to what extent do those social relations mold them to the point that their agency is negated? Within Marxist theory, the classical Althusserian reading of social relations suggests that social structures are strong to the point that they negate class agency. Point 17 Against this, class theory and humanist Marxists argue that class agency matters, and identify a degree of blame in those class forces and agents who act for and benefit from the interests of capital. Point 18 Even on this reading, though, the power of ideology, the power of the state apparatus and the production of alienation are strong to the point that individual agents may not be complicit. In the vagaries of capitalist societies, a point reinforced by the power of the current context in which austerity is reinforced by strategies for popular endorsement or pathological estrangement. This kind of analysis is not exclusive to Marxists. One might think, for instance, of Foucauldian analyses of the forms of governmentality that normalize, internalize, and ultimately reproduce certain behaviors, practices and discourses. Point 19 These reflections demonstrate further the problems in analytical attributions of complicity as something that meets clearly defined criteria of responsibility for actions and knowledge of the effects of actions. At the same time, they also highlight a second use of complicity as a rhetorical device in structural critique, namely, in attributing individual agency within structural forms of domination. Structural analyses can sometimes work to encourage actors to retreat in the face of the overbearing constraints to the possibility of change. On this basis, advocates of such forms of analysis often deny any responsibility for the existing order. This can even encourage some self-professed Marxists to acquire property, extract rents and consume conspicuously on the basis that only social revolution will bring about change. By making rhetorical accusations of their complicity with orders that they alone cannot change, it is possible to make important political arguments. Specifically, such accusations could be used to show that the complicit individuals should still explore ways in which they can become less or indeed anti-complicit, even while acknowledging that this alone will not lead to radical systemic change. Accruing property and extracting rents, while having some awareness of the role this plays in wider structural forms of domination, can render one particularly complicit in the reproduction of capitalist orders, and an individual could become less complicit by refraining from such practices. In this sense, Complicity offers an important lens that can operate between binaries of structure and agency, showing that individuals can be complicit in 44 Paul Reynolds Structural forms of domination, even while they cannot alone change or even fully understand those relations of domination. Viewing complicity as a lens through which to develop structural critique also raises questions about whether individual acts that attempt to exit from involvement in problematic structures or redress the wrongs of the world suffice to avoid complicity. If we know enough about famine and starvation, yet we only give to charity and do not demand global change that would redistribute wealth and transform the cost of goods, are we complicit in the reproduction of suffering? Is the act of charitable giving an act of complicity when it is clear it addresses symptoms and not causes? 20 Recognizing social structures when talking about complicity can lead to the conclusion that actions considered morally generous that do not challenge structural determinants, or even levels of opposition that do not challenge structural determinants, can be regarded as complicit. This discussion of agency and structure leaves us with a sense that complicity, while it might first be used to articulate associations that map onto unethical or hostile political acts, quickly becomes a means of extending rhetorical accusations beyond those direct, joint enterprise or joint benefit associations that might be identified as engendering liability and responsibility. Those who participate grudgingly in offering limited opposition to problematic practices, or who act in a way that might be seen as individually generous but nonetheless reinforces or even fails to challenge the status quo, can also be regarded as complicit. Thinking of complicity in terms of agency and structure thus recognizes, on the one hand, that a strictly agentic approach narrows the political utility of the concept. As a result, it widens the net for the construction of political narratives that ascribe complicity. On the other hand, it also shows the rhetorical power of complicity in asking us to consider the role agents play in reproducing, and hence becoming complicit in, structural wrongdoings, distance or imminence. A second dimension shaping the effectiveness of rhetorical attributions of complicity is that of temporal, spatial, and relational distance or imminence. Imminence, here, can reflect closeness in time, closeness in space or closeness in relationships and associations. Relationships and associations might be spatially or temporally distant, but nonetheless have a feeling of imminence. Diasporic identifications might involve a set of relationships that is distant in temporal terms, but nonetheless feels very close. 
one might have very close affiliations with particular ancestral or historical ideas of cultural conventions, even if these close relations are felt with something that is in the distant past. Complicity as political rhetoric 45. Claims of complicity are often made when what we are complicit in is close to us or close to how we self-identify. This suggests that while claims of complicity can be made in relation to our links to actions performed at a distance or through complex and indirect structural causes and effects, accusation of complicity is more likely to be recognized as meaningful and have a powerful rhetorical effect when there is a sense of proximity between the complicit actor, or omitter, and the action in which he or she are complicit. It is for this reason that Althusser remained pessimistic with regard to the question of political resistance based on class. The overdetermination of structures of practice and the repressive and ideological structures that reinforce them can mean that what is closest to us is nevertheless heavily penetrated by structure, and hence feels so distant that it obliterates chances of an identification of a person as a class agent. This importance of proximity reflects a broader and more fundamental ethical problem in considering the dissemination of public and collective ethics. This problem is exemplified in Eagleton's Trouble with Strangers, which addresses the spatio-temporal problems of extending ethics beyond immediate relationships. Point 21 from Adam Smith's Spectator through Mill's consequentialism to McIntyre's pessimism, any attempt to move ethical practice from the community or the interpersonal transaction to wider contexts diminishes the sense in which ethical values are sustained. Point 22 It is difficult to be tolerant of child starvation when it is in your eye line. When it occurs on a global scale, however, it is recognized but nonetheless regarded as insoluble except by gradual forms of change that disallow its continuation. Measuring consequences and attributing causes to those consequences becomes progressively more complex, making it difficult to weigh up both moral outcomes and our complicity with moral wrongs. While we might not want to act unethically or have shared intentions that are unethical, it is difficult to know how to scale a demarcation between having individual or collective responsibility and having no responsibility for these forms of suffering. In a global world, the actions of states, including democracies, however limited, firms and publics clearly have impacts that it is difficult for us not to admit complicity with. The habits of relatively well-off consumers shape the failures of indigenous farming and the power of multinationals across the southern hemisphere. Point 23 Global tourism changes the composition of local industries to service and dependency. Are we, as a part of publics who consume and travel for recreation, complicit? At what point does the scale of a claim for complicity, through myriad chains of association, become so complex as to lose meaning? Again, there is a real sense that the extent to which someone is complicit is not a matter of analytical precision, but one of persuasive rhetorical claims. Moreover, depending on the audience in question and the Aims in making the claim, attributing different degrees of complicity may be. 46 Paul Reynolds. Strategically advisable. It may be that complicity works well as a rhetorical device in pricking middle class consciousness in an attempt to get them to change their consumption practices, but works less well when attempting to mobilize mass protests against the powerful. This issue of scale is temporal as well as spatial. Consider the example of claims of slavery reparations, as put forth by Brennan and Packer and Beckles. Point 24 The crux of these claims is that contemporary wealthy, formerly slave owning, and slave using societies have a debt to pay on the basis that their societies were built upon imperialist, colonial, and slave economies. In these accounts, slavery and other forms of domination were central to the emergence of modern and relatively wealthy societies, and also played a crucial role in the historical development of contemporary global inequality and poverty. Does that make us complicit in the acts of those who preceded us historically? Western societies certainly benefit from continuing global inequalities, corporate power, and impoverishment, and these inequalities, power relations, and forms of suffering were built on the back of slavery. Does it make sense, though, to claim that people with no direct association to historical events are complicit? How far back is that taken? Should Swedes and Norwegians be sued for Viking raids? These questions demonstrate the problem of time in ascribing complicity. The argument about complicity in slavery still has political capital because of slavery's historical imminence, it can be, and often is, meaningfully evoked in attempts to use our complicity as a device through which to justify redress by way of offering international aid to poor countries that were subjected to the slave trade, as well as through positive steps taken to address racial discrimination and prejudice. When we go back further to the Viking raids, though, it becomes far harder to put together a convincing rhetorical argument for people's complicity. Normal and exceptional. A final dimension through which we can understand complicity concerns the dichotomous contrast of what is regarded as normal and what is exceptional. Here, we might take cognizance of Foucault's analysis of normalization and internalization to make sense of common perceptions of complicity. Accusations of complicity often relate to what is perceived to be exceptional activity, where the act or development in which one has shared intentions and a shared volition is alien to conventional values and orthodoxies. Complicity is an exceptional activity. It can lead to a focus on particular bad agents, such as politicians, rather than damaging structures, corrupt political systems, see also Thomas, this book. This specificity of agency is underlined by its exceptionality. People step out of their normal behavior and into an enterprise. Complicity as political rhetoric 47. Where they are complicit in its goals, impact, and effects, directly or indirectly. Their complicity marks them as engaging in something that is not normal. Their agency, or their acquiescence, indifference, or inaction, underlines their involvement and renders an attribution of powerful complicity. If they do not step out of the seemingly normal scope of everyday behavior and everyday engagement in the social system, the rhetorical accusation of complicity is considered weaker. To illustrate, 
the fly tipper, the waste dumper and the litterer are all complicit to degrees in environmental degradation on the basis that their behavior is out of line with normal, everyday practices. Conversely, those who follow social conventions concerning waste disposal that, despite being normal, continue to have negative effects on the environment, are less likely to be considered complicit, making it harder to make rhetorical claims regarding their complicity in environmental decline. The notion of exception is itself value-loaded. It is determined by those in power. In addition, what is exceptional often becomes persistent. Initially exceptional anti-terrorist legislation and intrusive security measures have persisted since the events of September 11, 2011, establishing what is now becoming a new normal. The dividing line between normal and exceptional is therefore blurred and problematic. Thinking about the more structural notion of complicity discussed above in contexts of exceptional practices, processes and activities can direct us towards a consideration of how what appear to be everyday routines and processes produce and reflect complicity in social ills. This might draw into play Arendt's ethical entreaty of the banal character of evil. For Arendt, we are normalized into accepting or engaging in practices because we are brought to see them as normal. Point 25 The recent prosecutions of celebrities like Jimmy Subbill for child abuse stress the exceptional nature of the behavior of abusers. They also reveal a web of those who, for reasons of benefit or acquiescence, did not act upon their knowledge of the abuse and might thus be regarded as complicit in it. Point 26 It follows that complicity can be attributed to actors when they uphold what is, despite its seeming exceptionality, a normal state of affairs. Claims of complicity may go further still. It might be argued that the broadly accepted, society wide, sexualization of girls, the fetishization of youthful sexual bodies, the sexualized fashion of young girls and the use of photographic technologies to accentuate youthful bodies in the media, constitutes and normalizes corporate pedophilia. Point 27. Conclusions. This chapter has argued that complicity is best understood as a rhetorical device. It has suggested that the power of complicity emerges from its 48 Paul Reynolds. Successful deployment within language games, and not from its precise, analytical use. While complicity is a potent tool of political rhetoric, however, it cannot be completely divorced from analytical work that uses more critical and abstract language to attribute and describe responsibilities and accountabilities. The task of exposing and characterizing the complicit relationships that constitute power in capitalist, heteropatriarchal, racial, imperialist and ableist societies is one of the important functions of radical intellectual work. It is this work that enables claims concerning someone's complicity in these often structural forms of domination to have meaning and a powerful rhetorical effect. Provided this work is done, complicity can be used as a rhetorical tool to highlight the forms through which such dominatory orders are reproduced. These forms of complicity range from active, knowing acquiescence, through knowing omission, to omission combined with culpable forms of ignorance. Moreover, complicity can allow us to express a sense in which there might be broader, if different, responsibilities for events or states of affairs beyond formal and direct attributions such as collusion and conspiracy. When understood in this broad sense, and not as a narrow analytical concept, complicity can also be turned reflexively upon ourselves and upon constituencies wider than that of those in power and those directly aiding and abetting power. One of the problems of the philosophical accounts of what complicity is lies in their emphasis on intentionality and volition. They become far more contentious when we begin to explore complicity as doing nothing, not acting, not showing volition, or not having intention. This is not a case launching the most tenuous accusations of complicity against the Wittest population, as that would act as an apologia for the exercise of power and order in society. Nonetheless, it encourages us to focus on the role we play as individuals in reproducing dominatory structures, even as it maintains a structural form of critique. Indeed, focusing on the way in which our agency is limited and on how we are forced to, or given little choice but to, be complicit in structural forms of domination might be a way of encouraging us to think about building collective associations that are oppositional. The concept of complicity is a salient rhetorical tool and a means of reflecting ethically and politically on the constitution of ills in our society. It raises questions of liability, responsibility, and culpability for these. Yet upon close examination, it is less satisfactory than many of the concepts it shares familiarity with. It ultimately takes us no further than the ideological representations that juxtapose agency and structure with different degrees of power in contemporary societies. Nor does it help to stretch conscious. Ness from imminent to distant or exceptional to normal because generally. Such attributions of complicity are considered to lack credibility. However, because of its potency as a term of use in our political vocabulary, it should not be disregarded, but rather used rhetorically and reflectively to start. Complicity as Political Rhetoric 49 and sustain interrogations of the ethical and political choices we have in 21st century societies. The political task is to articulate the rhetorical power of narratives that evoke complicity towards incorporating complicity in structural as well as agential wrongdoing, in distant events, activities, and relations as well as close ones, and in forms of wrongdoing that are ordinary as well as ones that are exceptional. Notes. 1. The piece emerged organically from a more circumspect offering at the Complicity Conference. Thanks are due to those who heard and commented on the talk, and to the editors of this book for their subsequent feedback and editorial work. 2. C. For example, Nathan Lean, The Islamophobia Industry, How the Right Manufactures Fear of Muslims, London, Pluto, 2012, Deepak Kumar, it 53. Chapter 4. For Our Sins. 
Christianity, complicity and the racialized construction of innocence. Marika Rose. It is always dangerous to assert an essence of anything as sprawling, diverse and multiple as Christianity, which is an institution, or a tradition, or a body that has always been as much at war with itself as with any of the others against which it constitutes itself. But it is perhaps close enough to something like the truth to suggest that, somewhere near the heart of this monstrous body, this, un, holy city, is a problem that can be set out something like this, Jesus Christ died for our sins. Perhaps that sounds less like a problem than a solution, but the devil is, as always, in the details. Jesus died for our sins. So to be a Christian is to hold two things simultaneously, first, that we are sinful, and second, that our sinfulness has somehow been addressed and accounted for by the work of Christ. This can lead in two directions which are nicely signified by the two central rites of Christianity. Baptism and the Eucharist. Point one Baptism is a symbol of death and new birth, and also of cleansing. We go down into the water and we come up changed, clean, new. What we leave behind in the waters of baptism, or so the symbol suggests, are all of our old ties, our old identities as determined by our citizenship, our sex, or our families. Point two Baptism cleanses us, according to the Western Christian tradition, of original sin. It cleanses us, that is, of complicity, of the guilt we incur simply by being born into this world, into relation with all those who have sinned before us. Point three Jesus died for our sins so that we need die only in the symbolic death and resurrection of baptism. We are born again, as the scriptures say, we once were guilty and now we are innocent. Point four but the second core rite of Christianity is the Eucharist, which suggests that this new life into which Christians enter is perhaps less secure than the one-off rite of baptism suggests. Christian identity is maintained, in some way, by repeated participation in this rite by which we partake of, or sim. Bolize, the body and blood of this Christ who died for our sins. The Eucharist. 54 Marika Rose. Is important at least in part because of the way it repeats or invokes the process by which our sins are dealt with. In the Anglican tradition the Eucharistic service begins with the confession of sins, committed through negligence, weakness, or our own deliberate fault, which is followed by assurance of God's forgiveness for those sins, culminates with the congregation partaking of the bread and wine, and concludes with the sending of the congregation out into the world, taking with them that message, Jesus died for our sins. I am suggesting, then, that what we see in baptism is conversion, a singular move from one identity to another, an old to a new, five and what we see in the Eucharist is confession, the process by which we repeatedly own up to our sins and are cleansed of them. I have hedged my words here because, while in some ways baptism and the Eucharist are central to what Christians holds in common, they are also some of the key terms around which Christianity works out its internal battles over what it is, over what it means that Jesus died for our sins. Whose sins did Christ die for, exactly? How thoroughly have we been cleansed? Baptism and the Eucharist are both key markers of the fault lines internal to Christianity. Which baptisms count, which Eucharists count, how we think about what they do to us, all of these arguments have been going on as long as Christianity has existed, not despite but precisely because they are so fundamental to the constitution of Christian identity. From the beginning, Christianity has constituted itself around the question of who is in and who is out. Daniel Boyarin argues that what was originally distinctive about Christianity was the way it delinked religion for the first time from cultural givenness, such that religion was no longer about membership of a tradition but, rather, about right belief, orthodoxy. What is new about Christianity as a religion is the notion that religious identity is achieved rather than simply given by birth, history, language, and geographical location, Christian identity cuts across existing forms of identity, creating something new precisely by disentangling Christians from their relation to, and complicity with, the world around them. Point six in Christ, says St. Paul, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Point seven what there is instead is a new distinction, between people who are Christians and people who are not. A key debate within recent New Testament studies has been between the traditional reading of St. Paul and the new perspective on Paul. Point eight, the CLASical reading of St. Paul takes him to be saying that the purpose of the Jewish law was to make the Jewish people righteous, that is, to make them into good people, into innocent people. For Paul, the classical reading holds, what happens in Christianity is that we discover that it is simply not possible to be good by virtue of our own efforts. This is why we need Jesus, to deal with our sin. But the new perspective on Paul holds that the issue is not so much. For our sins 55 about innocence and who gets to count as a good person, but about identity, about who gets to count as part of God's chosen people. On this account, the law of the Hebrew Bible is not so much about creating good people as it is about marking a certain group of people out as belonging to God, this saves us, at least, from trying to explain why eating shellfish, wearing clothes of mixed fibers or picking the correct small animal to sacrifice after the birth of a child might be fundamental moral issues, point nine what changes in Christianity, according to the new perspective, is that suddenly the boundaries of God's People are marked out not by adherence to a particular set of rules about diet, religious observance, and what to do when you find mildew in your house, but by one simple marker of identity, belief in Jesus. What complicates this neat opposition between innocence and identity, however, is the content of this belief in Jesus. What do Christians believe about Jesus? That he died for our sins. And this is why, despite the insistence of the new perspective scholars that Christianity is about identity rather than innocence, I will side with Gil Anajar's recent claim that Christianity is precisely both. 
Christianity is the difference between innocence and guilt as the basis of human society, the difference across humanity, between the old and guilty, humans, and the new and innocent, Christians. Point 10 Christianity is a mechanism for escaping complicity. The assertion of an identity that divides the world up newly into Christian and non-Christian, guilty, and innocent, was perhaps subversive when Christians were members of a marginal sect. It became rather less so after Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, although it's worth noting that Constantine himself delayed baptism until he was literally on his deathbed, so that, we might infer, he could carry on being guilty for as long as he was able to enjoy it. So Christianity, this identity which is deeply bound up with innocence, eventually lost its imp. Real subversiveness and became an empire in its own right. This dangerous combination of innocence with imperial power came to a kind of fruition in medieval Europe, where Christian identity lost its original elective character and became instead an ontological attribute, as Christianity invented race. In 1054, an ironically named peace council took place, in which it was decided to replace an earlier prohibition on the shedding of any human blood with a very much more specific prohibition on the shedding of Christian blood. 11 It is no coincidence that only 40 years later Pope Urban II proclaimed the First Crusade, in which the slaughter of Muslims was not merely permitted but actively encouraged. Point 12 Roughly 200 years later, Humbert of Romans wrote a theological defense of the Crusades. He cited one of Jesus' parables, in which weeds are allowed to continue growing in a field of wheat until harvest time, because they cannot be removed without damaging the wheat. Point 13 But the people of the 56 Marika Rose Muslim lands, Humbert argues, are all weeds and no wheat, none of them are Christians and so all of them are guilty, therefore there can be no harm in condemning them to death. Point 14 Another 200 years later, in 1449, the governing body of the city of Toledo, in Spain, issued the notorious statutes on the purity of blood, which declared that so fundamental was the difference between Christian innocence and the guilt of Jews and Muslims that even conversion could not save those. Born into guilt, Christianity, the statutes maintained, was in the blood. It was no longer enough simply to confess belief in the saving action of Jesus, rather, to be counted as a Christian, a person would need proof of pedigree. It is here, then, that numerous historians locate the birth of modern racism. Point 15 As Willie Jennings puts it, the very process of becoming Christian took on nuantic markers which were aesthetic and racial. 16 Those racialized. Others now ontologically outside the sphere of Christianity continue to be guilty, complicit, and vulnerable to the violent judgment of God. Those within the sphere of Christianity and of whiteness were innocent, safe, and able to enact God's judgment upon others in the name of their salvation. Point 17 Just as Christianity once defined itself against the pagan religions and heretical sects it conjured into being, so too the secular defines itself precisely in opposition to the category of religion, which it invents, not so much escaping the logic of Christianity. As repeating it, to become secular, Daniel Colucciello Barber says, Europe must emancipate itself from its own religious heritage, conceiving itself not as the coming together of Athens and Jerusalem but as the triumph of Athens over Jerusalem, the secular West rejects religion for itself, but it does so, one might say, as the price that must be paid in order to reject the non-West by characterizing this non-West as religious 18 where once the world was newly divided into Christian and non-Christian, the secular announces itself as the division of the world into secular, by which we might infer white, civilized, and reasonable, and the religious, by which we might infer black, savage, and fanatical. Point 19 Among the many characteristically Christian elements which the secular West retains in its conversion from religious to secular is the relationship between identity and innocence. The secular is constitutively innocent, the religious constitutively guilty. The rise of the secular state marks also the privatization and individualization of religion, and therefore also of innocence and guilt, even as it brings to birth an unprecedented global economic system in which each part is ever more constituted by the whole to which it belongs. The secular West castigates those it colonizes and enslaves for their refusal to let go of ties to family, land, and religion for the freedom of rational individuality even as it binds them ever more tightly to its own universalizing system for order in the world. For all its vaunted secularity and universality, Christianity. For our sins 57. Remains, as Marx argues, the special religion of capital. 20 Where Christian salvation depends upon both the singular moment of baptism and the regular demonstration of faith by participation in the Eucharist, under capitalism what matters is not so much whether one is welcomed into the world with the sprinkling of holy water but whether one is born with a silver spoon in one's mouth, not so much the faith without which the Eucharistic rite is ineffective but whether or not a person has credit. Point 21 Nor, as one might expect from a system whose emergence depended in large part on the classification of black people as property, does capitalism transcend Christianity's racialized logic of guilt, transposing instead the association of whiteness with innocence and blackness with guilt to the logic of whiteness as credibility and blackness as indebtedness. Point 22 This inheritance and mutation of the Christian construction of guilt and innocence gives rise to a world in which white Westerners in particular are more profoundly complicit than ever before in the dominant structures of global power, and yet are constructed precisely as innocent subjects. From the white man's burden to the white savior industrial complex, what white people, and I include myself here, inherit from Christianity is not only the conviction that we are innocent, but also the notion that we hold the key to the salvation of the world, the cure for what ails it and a corresponding inability to conceive of the possibility that we might, in fact, be the problem. Point 23 Instead of the distinction between pure-blooded Christians with long ancestral lineages and those recent converts whose baptism can never really be trusted to have washed away the guilt that is in their blood, 
Today the line between complicity and innocence functions through the distinction between white people and those citizens who will never be able to escape the perennial question, but where are you really from? To talk about complicity, to talk about innocence and guilt, clean hands and dirty hands, is always also to talk about white supremacy, to talk about the ways in which we are differently constructed as ontologically guilty or ontologically innocent. Point 24 There is an a priori association of blackness with guilt, criminality. Dot 25 Conversely, to be white is to have been always already baptized into the field of innocence such that we can only ever be held responsible for our individual transgressions and never for our complicity in the social, economic and political structures to which we belong. With sustained effort we might, like Jimmy Saville, Anders Breivik, or Andreas Lubitz, attain to the hard won status of monsters. But we will always be innocent until proven guilty, lone figures of inexplicable evil rather than symptoms of a deeper malaise, and perhaps even then we will find that the police are willing to destroy or falsify incriminating evidence to save us, as many current members of British Parliament and those responsible for the killing of Mark Duggan have no doubt noted with relief. Point 26. 58. Mark arose. There are, for white people, few sins that cannot be washed away through the mere act of confession. Point 27. Sarah Ahmed writes about a politics of declaration in which institutions and individuals admit to forms of bad practice and the admission itself becomes seen as good practice, the strange logic whereby a report about the institutional racism of an institution is seen as good practice, as though the mere confession of the sin is enough to expunge it. Ahmed describes such declarations of whiteness as unhappy performatives, structurally unable to affect what they purport to point 28 yet if innocence is racialized as white, is modeled on the Christian progression from confession to forgiveness, then in some ways we might say that they achieve exactly what they are supposed to, absolution. Of course the boundaries of innocence are never entirely fixed, any more than were the boundaries of Christendom. Access to innocence, escape from complicity, is always possible for those who are willing to struggle vigorously against the ontological evil of others. We see this conversion into innocence, into whiteness, at work, for example, in the treatment of George Zimmerman, the Hispanic man exonerated of the murder of Trayvon Martin, a black teenager, in the overwhelming Western support for the apartheid state of Israel, or in the generosity of the UK government's treatment of millionaire non-doms of color, in contrast to its brutality towards those others who lack the credit to make the conversion from immigrants to expats. Point 29. The cost of innocence, these days, is baptism into what Robin James calls multiracial white supremacist patriarchy or MRWASP, a term which seeks to describe a new form of hegemony which includes some marginalized groups within the realm of innocence, and outside the realm of complicity, in order to maintain more efficiently its exclusion of others. 30 if MRWASP is the problem, yet is also a system for making certain people innocent and other people guilty, then those of us for whom it exists find ourselves in a Chinese finger trap, which tightens around us the more we try to escape it. The harder we try to get free, to exonerate ourselves, the more deeply we invest ourselves in the very innocence which makes us guilty. So then, what is to be done? Can we talk about complicity without making this conversation itself a ruse for reaffirming our innocence? In his autobiography, Malcolm X recounts a meeting he had with a young white woman. I never will forget one little blonde coed after I had spoken at her New England college. She must have caught the next plane behind that one I took to New York. She found a Muslim restaurant in Harlem. I just happened to be there when she came in. Her clothes, her carriage, her accent, all showed deep South white breeding and money. At that college, I told how, the guild of American whites included their knowledge that in hating Negroes, they were hating, they were rejecting, they were denying, their own blood. For our since 59. Anyway, I'd never seen anyone I ever spoke to before more affected than this little white college girl. She demanded, right up in my face, don't you believe there are any good white people? I didn't want to hurt her feelings. I told her, people's deeds I believe in, miss, not their words. What can I do, she exclaimed. I told her, nothing. She burst out crying and ran out and up Lenox Avenue and caught a taxi.31. Towards the end of her discussion of the non-performativity of anti-racism, Sarah Ahmed says. A white response to this paper has asked the question, but what are white people to do? This question can work to block hearing, in moving on from the present towards the future, it can also move away from the object of critique, or place the white subject outside that critique in the present of the hearing.32. Perhaps here we might return, at last, to the figure of Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, and in doing so made possible the fraught relationship between innocence and complicity that so characterizes the contemporary Western world. The Gospel of Matthew tells the story, curiously evocative of Malcolm X's tale, of the rich young ruler, who came to Jesus to ask him, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come, follow me. When the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions.33. Matthew's Gospel repeatedly invokes two themes which circle around the same metaphor. The first is the theme of Jesus as a stumbling stone, a rock in the path over which people trip, a scandal and an offense. The second is the theme of a solid rock upon which the community which forms around Christ is to be built, with Christ as its cornerstone. The Gospel of Matthew presents its readers with a choice, then, to be offended by Christ, to stumble over the message of Christianity, or to take Christ as the firm foundation, the cornerstone of the edifice it builds upon his message. 
perhaps for those of us admitted into the sphere of innocence, of white supremacy, the problem is the reverse, can we learn how to stop building this edifice of self-satisfaction, to cease from walling ourselves off from responsibility, and learn instead to be scandalized by the problem of our own reliance on the logic of absolute. Can we recognize and confront our own complicity even if to do so? Might also mean to let go of the desire to be counted as a good person? If it comes at the cost of everything we own? Can we learn to treat the question of complicity in the way by which Marcella Althaus Reed suggests that a queer? 60 Marika Rose Materialist theology might treat the Jesus who died for our sins, a stone in the road to force us to stop, fall down, while pausing in our pain and thinking during the pause, 34. Notes 1. Capitalizing baptism and Eucharist imposed a particular theological understanding of what they signify, which I wanted to avoid, hence the lower case. 2. As Slava Zizek argues, the Christian good news, gospel, is that it is possible to suspend the burden of the past, to cut the ropes which tie us to our past deeds, to wipe the slate and begin again from zero. Slava Zizek, did somebody say totally Terrianism, five interventions in the, miss, use of a notion, London, Verso, 2001, 53. 3. This link between baptism and original sin was first made by Cyprian in 253 CE and cemented by Augustine who argued, largely from a need to justify the practice of infant baptism, that baptism was necessary for the remission of original sin, though his Eastern Orthodox contemporaries rejected this notion. See John E. Tobes, The Story of Original Sin, Eugene Orr, Pickwick Publications, 2013, 65, 89, and 98. 4. The community into which the new Christian is born is the community figured. As the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, that is, the body of the Christ who is repeatedly described in the Christian scriptures in the language of purity and innocence, faithful Christians are those who have been cleansed from their past sins, 2 Peter 1, 9, who have been cleansed with blood, Hebrews 9:22, who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, Revelation 7:14. that is, Christ, the Lamb without blemish or defect, who is offered up to purify the people of God, 1 Peter 1, 19. 5 Daniel Coluciello Barber, The Imminent Refusal of Conversion, Journal for Cultural and Religious Theory 13, 2014 142. 6 Daniel Boyarin, Borderlines, The Partition of Judeo Christianity, Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania Press, 2004, 17. 7 Galatians 3 28. 8 For an overview of the debate and its history, see James D. G. Dunn, The New Perspective on Paul, Grand Rapids M.I., William B. Eerdmans, 2008. 9 C, for example, Leviticus 11 9, 12, 19, 19, and 12, 6, 8. Sixty-five, Chapter 5. Complicity. What is it, and how can it be avoided? Pam Leitman. Read about healthcare and it is not long before you come across the term complicity or the suggestion that some individuals or groups of practitioners were or are being complicit in something wrong to the detriment of the health of those using health services. Point one even a brief review of the bookshelves and newspaper articles on healthcare will indicate as much. Doctors are complicit with pharmaceutical companies, professional organizations with politicians, researchers with funders, managers with private providers, directors acting together in a complicit manner to secure and implement political cost-cutting and evidence-based rationing. I make no comment on the accuracy, or not, of these accusations. Instead, the aim of this chapter is to problematize the way in which the term complicity is used in such healthcare discourse. Perhaps the most conventional understanding of complicity is that of individuals who, while not directly engaging in acts of wrongdoing, act in a way that nonetheless implicates them in such wrongdoing, and such individuals are considered to be blameworthy. So, if my acts constitute entering a conspiracy, colluding in cooperation with others, conniving to act in consort with them, or if I am responsible for actively encouraging others to become involved in acts of wrongdoing, then I am complicit and thus, in some way, responsible for the outcomes and consequences resulting from what the wrongdoer has done. Point two in this sense, complicity clearly has negative connotations, since it is a case of one's actions, or inactions, in some way. Contributing to wrongdoing, being complicit is a wrong or bad thing to do. Point three for the sake of brevity, from this point onwards I will be referring to this conventional framing of complicity as the traditional view of complicity. In this chapter I wish to do two things. First, I wish to raise some concerns about this traditional view of complicity. In particular, I want to point out. 66 Pam Leitman. Certain issues that arise from depending on a notion of complicity which is legalistic at its roots, such legal framing confines our understanding of complicity, underplays the potential of complicity in being a tool of critique for wrongdoing, and ultimately offers little help if we aim to try to avoid being complicit in wrongdoing, as we surely ought to. Second, following my CRIT of the traditional view of complicity, I will also consider some of the problems and dangers that might appear when reconsidering the concept of complicity within a broader, non-legal space of mundane and everyday CIR circumstances involving moral decisions. My argument will be that, if we are to offer ideas about how individuals can avoid being complicit, then we need to have a clearer distinction between the act of being complicit and an act of wrongdoing. We need, further, to better understand how individual agents themselves frequently act in relation not only to other agents, but also to the wider social and organizational structures they live and operate within. 
Thus, by contextualizing the notion of complicity, I will raise the possibility that we need to understand ourselves as necessarily complicit beings, complicity can create us as individuals within our relations with others and, as Butler suggests, be a condition of our responsibility to others. Point for what Butler alludes to is that our capacity to avoid complicity is affected by the social structures within which we find ourselves. Finally, by using the healthcare system in England as an example, this chapter will suggest that, to a significant extent, the larger institutional structures of society can remove from our individual agency the capacity to avoid becoming or being complicit, or indeed even our ability to recognize our being complicit in the first place. Retaining, or reclaiming, the latter ability is crucial, it might enable individuals to stop acting unwittingly in ways which not only cause injustice and harm to others, but also serve to maintain unjust structures. Complicity, problematizing the traditional view. The traditional view of complicity identified above indicates that complicity is a wrong and something any individual should try to avoid. Indeed, in the media and in common usage of the word, the accusation of complicity has become little more than name-calling, as if complicity is always necessarily wrong, and fixing that label on an act will settle some moral issue decisively. Point 5. The negative moral weight carried by the term complicity predominantly emerges from the idea that complicit acts are necessarily wrong because of their link to the wrongdoing of another, or a group of others. Of course, I am not trying here to refute the existence of this kind of complicity. However, the situation is much more complex than this simple linear relation between complicity and wrongdoing implies, as the literature also suggests, there. Complicity 67. Can be complicity in wrongdoing for the greater good, and being complicit in wrongdoing can, on the balance of harms, be potentially right given the alternatives available. Point 6 There can indeed be complicity dilemmas, situations where one cannot help but be complicit in wrongdoing, regardless of how one proceeds. Point 7 In addition, commitment to a group or a practice, and the compromises we make when living a social life, have recently come to be seen through the lens of complicity. Point 8 So to understand complicity as something self evidently wrong is not the only way to make sense of it. Indeed, these wider perspectives sit uncomfortably with the traditional view of complicity. Another characteristic of the traditional view is its embeddedness within a legal framework. As Owen Thomas notes in this book, the dominant methodology for legally investigating cases of complicity strictly adheres to the method of juridical inquiry. The underlying assumption of such inquiry is that complicity is defined as involvement in acts of wrongdoing, acts which are committed by an individual or a group of wrongdoers. Not only does this approach offer a very narrow understanding of what complicity is, but it also has a limited scope when it comes to considering how to avoid being complicit. To begin with, a legal conception of complicity requires the existence of a wrongdoing which must be imputable to actors who broke the law. Any wrongdoing which does not fall within this specific category of lawbreaking remains largely unaccounted for. Point 9 Also, the immersion of complicity within a legal mode of thinking brings with it the assumption that addressing complicit acts necessarily involves making decisions about what the intentions and guilt of individuals were, as well as asking questions of appropriate punishment and restitution. It frames complicit acts exclusively as wrongful contributions of individuals to the crimes of others. Not being complicit is a real possibility from this view, it would simply be a matter of not contributing, in whatever way, to the breaking of the law. This traditional, legal framework does not, however, give us the full picture, indeed, it may even be offering a profoundly distorted understanding of what complicity is. It assumes that not being complicit is the normal state of affairs, and it can only do so because it fails to recognize people as agents who are embedded and interconnected within social structures. If we look beyond the constraints of the legal framework, complicity, if recognized and acknowledged, might even come to be seen in a positive light, rather than an exclusively negative 1.10 Is it not possible to be complicit in good acts, rather than just with acts of wrongdoing? For instance, could I be complicit when I support others to organize a surprise party? If an act of complicity could be linked with good acts of others, then, in principle, being complicit could be a good thing. In combination with the ideas that it can be right to be complicit in wrongdoing for the greater good or on the balance. 68 Pam Leitman Of harms, we could end up with a much wider conception of complicity than is traditionally offered. This wider conception could move our understanding of complicity away from its concentration on obvious and often catastrophic instances of wrongdoing and into the realm of the everyday, in which the wrongdoing that one is complicit in may not be so obvious. Therefore, the main problem of a legally defined understanding of complicity is that it offers little about how an individual could avoid being complicit other than the assumption that the wrongdoing of others will be both clearly identifiable and easy not to get involved with. Once wrongdoing has been identified, it is assumed that one would or should not act in any way that supports or encourages such wrongdoing. This view of complicity is based on an unrealistic expectation of individual moral agency and of the room individuals have for maneuver within the social structures in which they operate. 8. Therefore, the traditional view of complicity operates through a restricted framework, not only regarding the way by which we can learn to perceive the possibility of our current state of complicity, but also by limiting our analysis of viable alternative options, of how we could act otherwise. We have to ask ourselves, I would suggest, how much of this limited view on how to avoid being complicit emerges as a consequence of the traditional view of complicity being based on descriptions and accusations made after the act of wrongdoing, rather than before or in the course of one's being complicit. People are often identified as complicit retrospectively. Point 11 Using such a backward-looking perspective can lead us to be epistemically careless, to see on late mundane acts of complicity with straightforward acts of wrongdoing, often engulfing those who were merely present, 
accusing them of not preventing the harm even when they had insufficient knowledge and slash or power to do so. Point 12 If we are to offer ideas about how to avoid being complicit in wrongdo, ing, as we surely should, then we must distinguish more clearly the act of being complicit from the act of doing wrong, and consider both within the spatio-temporal context and social structures within which they occur. Finally, the traditional view of complicity tends to picture complicit acts as discrete decisions made in a static, binary world, a world of right and wrong, good and bad. However, if we are to think seriously about how to avoid being complicit, we will have to adopt a conception which understands complicity within a dynamic social context. From this view, complicity is not only, indeed not necessarily, to be understood as a culpable contribution to an act of wrongdoing. It could also refer to, for example, an insidious, creeping series of acts, something which can, following complicity's logic of incrementalism introduced by Thomas Docherty in this book, escalate into catastrophic wrongdoing, wrongdoing which itself has the potential of not being recognized as such. The earliest of these acts may not have been cases of being complicit in the bringing about of harm, but acts which took complicity 69. An agent to a future place where alternative options were removed, or to a space constructed in such a way that minor complicities no longer appeared to be acts that ought not to be done, but rather appropriate options within a given structure. In practice, might this dynamic, forward-looking, social perspective enable us to gain a better understanding of the complicity of the little perpetrator and the cumulative impacts of little acts of complicity over time? Might it help us better understand the notion of whistleblowing in the context of the wrongdoing contained within social structures as well as the wrongdoing of individuals? Complicity, broadening the concept. This brings us to the second part of this chapter, which will consider some ideas which could emerge from considering the notion of complicity within a broader perspective. I accept that there are difficulties with adopting a broader conception of complicity. If we view potentially complicit acts from a perspective of everyday, dynamic, current agency within relations with others, both good and bad, then the risk might be that our understanding of complicity becomes vague and ambiguous. Indeed, complicity could become an increasingly unproductive term, to be used only rhetorically to refer to acts that are both innumerable and necessarily wrong. However, I would suggest that this perspective can also offer the opportunity to step back and reconsider some basic practical and moral questions about complicity, in this way we might be able to address the deficiencies of the traditional view as outlined. Above. This broader perspective will probably not change many of the central considerations currently underpinning debates on complicity. Debates about complicity will still be about agency, about acting, or failing to act, in a direct or indirect manner, in a world where people are wronged and harmed. Acts of complicity will still operate within a context of shared purposes and slash or shared knowledge, be it the strong we intentions of Twamila and Miller or the weaker participatory intentions of Cuts.13 complicity will still require relations between people and involve decision making and reasoning which affect those relations. However, if complicity is viewed as a way of living and working in relations with others that could have positive as well as negative effects, just like any individual act can, then the concept of complicity becomes more integrally connected to everyday life. Viewing complicity in this way could perhaps allow us to see its role in contextualizing responsibilities more clearly and maybe reduce it sometimes. Unhelpful focus on attributing blame and silencing alternative options. If complicity is seen and acknowledged as a part of everyday relationships, both good and bad, rather than as an in itself wrong, individual agents may be. 70 Pam Liebman better place to identify and acknowledge when they are potentially becoming complicit with wrongdoing rather than just defending themselves when accused of complicity after the event. It could open up a way to better identify potential or actual small acts of complicity with wrongdoing earlier, more consistently, and with a clearer understanding of the social structure within which such acts cannot but occur, so that they can be addressed before they lead to more significant harms to others, a cumulative pattern that is so often seen in the abuse of those being cared for in institutions such as care homes and residential hospitals.14 such a broader Conceptualization will also open up a whole different set of perspectives from which to ask questions about complicit acts. For example, it seems to be commonly accepted that who we are, ourself, if such a thing exists, our identity, is wholly or partially constructed in and through our relations with others. As human beings we need to belong, to have mutual recognition and acceptance. The collective memory we share with others not only frames, but also enables and builds our identity. In a practical sense others tie us to places and spaces, evoking emotions, giving us a sense of rootedness, avoiding alienation, and giving us a voice that can be heard. Other people are an essential part of our personal narrative, making our identity visible and intelligible through shared cultural signs, symbols, and practices. If our identity is wholly or partially constructed and enabled through relations with others, if belonging is at the core of our individuality, then we are complicit in the creation of who we are and who others are. Would being complicit actually become an essential component of who we are as individuals? Are human beings necessarily complicit? If so, then this would not only support any assertion that avoiding complicity is impossible, but it would go further. By suggesting that being complicit is not about committing a single or series of acts during a specific period of time, but is actually a constitutive part of who we are. If this were the case, then the question would no longer be about how to avoid being complicit, based on the assumption that one can avoid contributing to wrongdoing, but about how to avoid the worst consequences of our being complicit, in that being complicit is what we always are. If we consider everyone necessarily to be complicit, then it may seem that the concept of complicity becomes meaningless and unhelpful. If everyone is complicit all the time, then, one might conclude, no one ever is. 
it may seem that the term complicity offers no more than other notions do, such as responsibility, accountability, and blame, or to serve as a term synonymous with these concepts whenever we act with others in certain ways. While a broader view of complicity does make this a possibility, it can also, by allowing us to acknowledge that everyone is necessarily complicit, reduce the scale and morally charged nature of being accused of an act of complicity. It may help to better separate in our thinking the being complicit from the doing of complicity 71. Wrong, even though drawing this distinction may not always be easy. However, it is an understanding of complicity in this broad sense, I would suggest, that is needed if we are to ask questions about how to avoid being complicit in wrongdoing. Point 15 Most individuals have some capacity, whether they use it or not, to identify whether an action taken by an individual is good or bad, right or wrong, and the capacity to reflect upon the potential outcomes and impacts, both good and bad, of the proposed actions of other individuals. Although this is a simplification, and we should not underestimate our level of inaccuracy in our assessments of others, most individuals do have the capacity to recognize and avoid being complicit in wrongdoing and the capacity to recognize and acknowledge when they have committed a complicit act in the past. However, it would be naive and problematic to suggest that decision-making about past and potential complicit acts is always quite so straightforward. Indeed, it can become highly complex, especially when considering the multitude of groups and institutions that individuals are involved in within their social context. Most human beings do not, and cannot, exist without social groups of others. Point 16 groups can give individuals access to opportunities, knowledge, and meanings that they would, and could, not have alone. Groups fulfill needs and make it possible for people to live, and to live well, they offer safe places to address conflicts and express views. Of course, groups also harm, they can oppress, exploit, and discriminate. The importance of groups to us as individuals suggests that complicity is not just about being complicit in the wrongdoing of individuals, but in group acts, good and bad, both within the group and with group actions that affect others outside the group. Group conduct can be pictured in two main ways. First, individuals are seen as conforming in their actions and attitudes to those of the groups of which they are members, developing psychological similarities, often under the malign influence of peer pressure, deferring to the prevailing, formal or informal, power structures and group roles, becoming depersonalized by their membership and complicit in group wrongdoing. Second, individuals are pictured as members of internally flexible, diverse, and dynamic groups with changing memberships, relations and purposes over time, which individuals contribute to and exert influence on, or not. Given this latter picture, does membership of a group automatically make one complicit in any group action and outcome, good or bad? If it is possible to give a general answer then I think the answer is probably yes unless one has taken specific action, s, to avoid involvement, to distance oneself from what one's group does. Individuals are automatically, if not straightforwardly, complicit in group actions and can, at least potentially, avoid being so only if they take action which sets them against what the group does. Assigning automatic complicity with group actions to group members would leave available the opportunity to 72 Pam Leitman Make decisions about the extent of each individual's causal contribution to, knowledge of, and responsibility for the group act of wrongdoing, as well as about the extent to which individuals are actually in a position, and can thus reasonably be expected, to set themselves against the group, and to do so with some degree of success. In this manner, a broader conceptual understanding of complicity enables us to ask questions about the notion of complicity as a structural phenomenon and revitalize discussions of what complicity is, and how it can be avoided. Point 17 Of course, not all groups will offer the same opportunities for identifying and avoiding complicity. I make no comment here on whether or not all groups are involved in identity construction and agency in broadly similar ways. Rather, what I wish to highlight is that when considering complicity in relation to groups, the size and the structural and organizational components of those groups need to be taken into consideration. The reason is that these Factors, among others no doubt, could impact on an individual's capacity and opportunities to recognize their being complicit, and to avoid it. It is not just that acting to avoid being complicit becomes a more complex task in larger and more formalized institutional structures. It is also, and maybe more importantly, that the nature of both complicity and avoiding being complicit can change. Complicity and the National Health Service Large institutional organizations, such as the National Health Service, NHS, in England, are involved in both constructing individual identity and giving people a sense of belonging within the structures of society. However, they can also act to reduce the agency of individuals, by requiring them to act in ways that can result in harms to others, and by limiting the possibility of their changing the structural processes within which they operate. This will mean that they are complicit in structural wrongdoing, and responsible for doing something about it. As Young puts it, all agents who contribute by their actions to the structural processes that produce injustice have responsibilities to work to remedy these injustices. 18 The sheer scale of large institutional structures such as the NHS distances most individual members from contributing to these institutions in any significant way. Even when they purport to be representative, the structures of institutions constrain, limit and formalize the opportunity to express alternative views and to PA participate, constructively and meaningfully, in group decision making. Only a few individuals decide what membership benefits people will receive and at what cost, defining and controlling the information and the options that will be made available. Complicity 73. This does not mean that such large institutions cannot do good things. 
it is just to point out that the formal structures required by institutional organizations of this scale can leave the opinions of any one individual unheard, even inexpressible. They can also exert power and control over individuals by framing their perceptions and limiting their potential and actual agency. Such large institutional structures thus create a significantly different context, compared to smaller groups, in which acts of wrongdoing and acts of complicity may and do take place, a context which raises different questions about how to avoid complicity. Most large institutions, be they state or business organizations, tend to actively promote a positive image of themselves. Democracy is a good thing, justice is obtainable, a product, brand, or service is the best available, an organization is caring and responsible. Although there is a difference between this promotional rhetoric and the reality experienced in everyday life, much of such institutional self-construction is hidden and the promotional rhetoric can, over time, become absorbed into cultural expectations, blinding us to the costs incurred and the alternatives available. So, for example, most members of the public in England would express a commitment to the NHS and a belief that it is an essential good of and for the country. Such a commitment and belief can, however, leave individuals more accepting of the insufficiencies, costs and difficulties of the practice of the NHS, or inhibit complaints and lower expectations. Does this mean that most of the population has become practically and morally complicit in perpetuating a fictional positive image of the NHS which they know to be wrong? Individually and collectively we are involved in complicit acts that perpetuate myths about realities which we see disappearing, if they ever existed at all, such as, having an ongoing relation. Ship with one doctor, care being available free when you get ill, the provision of the most effective treatment options, and only the best interests of a sick individual directing the practitioner's decisions and actions. We are complicit in a range of myths created by large institutional structures, beautifully formed and heavily promoted political and commercial myths maybe, but still myths. If we are complicit in these myths, then are we not also responsible and blameworthy for any harms that such institutional structures cause? But, if we are absorbed within a myth, how can we recognize our complicity, and how can we avoid being complicit? And how can we assess the level of responsibility of any single individual for being complicit in wrongdoing in such circumstances? What about those working for these large institutional organizations, be they state-run or private businesses, would such workers be even more complicit? It could be argued that working for and within a large institution would make individuals more likely to be heavily inculcated into the institutional myth and probably to have their own extended myths, according to their job. 74 Pam Laidman Role Workers are trained in such a way, be it for a few days on the job or for years through a university, that their thoughts and actions are colonized by sets of assumptions, values, and sources of information which enable them to correctly implement the given procedures, processes and criteria. Point 19 To use the words of mind space, it is possible to manipulate people's values and behaviors by ensuring that their choice environment options and context is controlled, if staff are trained well, then often all that is required is using the word because to trigger a compliance reaction. Point 20 If these large organizations only have workers who are compliant, institutionalized technicians, operating in relative isolation within only one bit of a larger, given structure, implementing the given procedures, sometimes distanced from the individual as they serve, and blind to the exclusions and harms their work may cause. Then how do such workers avoid being complicit in the wrongdoing of that institution? For example, today's NHS decisions about whether or not an individual is ill and requires treatment or further investigations, or is healthy and requires no response, are made by reference to a nationally applicable, evidence-based approach range of measures. These measures are expressed in categories according to factors such as birth decade and gender, into which that individual has been fitted. Point 21 in itself this is not wrong, of course, the medical literature has always informed diagnoses. However, the manner of application of the evidence-based approach within the NHS today introduces inbuilt biases in terms of the use made of, and value placed upon, different sources of evidence. The impact of the increasing dominance, especially via computer-assisted diagnostic tools, of the evidence-based approach has led it to be considered as the only valid way to work across all areas of healthcare. The nationally given ranges, criteria, and thresholds, while movable, have come to be viewed as facts about health and illness. Individual differences, outliers, and even statistical variations have been lost or forgotten. Diagnosis is less about individuals, their feelings of being unwell and their previous history of wellness, but rather about average Joe within a given category. This can lead not only to individuals being treated when they are well or not treated when they are sick, as diagnoses always can, but also to the introduction of bizarre notions such as an individual not yet being ill enough for treatment. There will, of course, be different levels and sources of responsibility between those who draft policy, those who manage processes, those who implement procedures and those who implement any associated tasks. However, the top-down pressures and moral climate within the NHS today has so normalized this application of the evidence-based approach that work. ERS can operate in a way that ignores individual differences in health and ill health, hides rationing, leaves some who are sick untreated and makes less. Complicity 75. Visible those who are excluded. Any consequent harms to some individuals become justified and indeed often invisible. Complicity in such a context is often described as having to go along with wrongdoing in order to do good for the majority of patients, or it is suggested that it is better on balance to accept complicity with wrongdoing as the inevitable price of rendering crucial assistance to vulnerable populations. Point 22 For workers in large institutional structures, I would suggest, such complicity is not just unacknowledged but often hidden and unavoidable. 
their situation is similar to Sartre's description of living under the occupation in Paris, we could not step, eat, or even breathe without making ourselves the occupier's accomplices. Every choice was wrong, and yet you had to choose, and we were responsible. Each beat of our hearts plunged us deeper into a horrifying culpability. 23. Working within the structures and formalities of large organizations can make individuals complicit by limiting and constraining their agency to conform to the accepted processes and procedures. 24. Indeed, the institutional necessity for a cohesive and consistent operation of precise interpretations of processes, criteria and procedures may indicate that in some way a degree of complicity by workers is actually required for such large organizations to function. However, with organizational functioning comes worker blindness. The constant reiteration of the mantras of an evidence-based approach suggests to those working in an institution like the NHS in England, first, that there is a cultural, moral, and factual purity to the practices required of them, and second that there is an objective style and rational quality of decision-making involved, even when their working experience would suggest that neither of these necessarily exist. Such extensions of the institutional myth for workers in large organi. Zational structures ensures that responsibility cannot be attached to any worker, s, involved in implementing the proscribed procedures, even when they lead to harms. Point 25 The myth defines not only the content of their work but also what is required for them to be seen as having integrity, the char actor they are to display for the role they play, and what will be seen as reasonable and unreasonable excuses for acting otherwise. So, for example, investigations following a death or severe harm to a patient tend to be about determining whether the workers involved followed the relevant procedures or not, and, if they did, then whether they did so in an appropriate manner so that their actions can be justified and they, and their institution, can be exonerated with respect to the harm caused. Point 26 questions about the value and use of the existing evidence base and the underpinning assumptions of the institutional structures are largely unreported. The criteria, thresholds, processes and procedures become facts within such investigations, their very existence is rarely questioned. Their content may be tinkered with and new procedures may be recommended, but existing ones are rarely removed. 76 Pam Leitman replaced or radically overhauled. In these circumstances, it is understandably rare for any individual worker to see any need to avoid being complicit in the wrongdoing involved in implementing the required working practices, let alone publicly to reflect on positive structural changes which might reduce consequent harm inequalities. Point 27 This description may seem to be yet another version of those never-ending debates about the guilt or otherwise of the soldier who obeys orders, of asking about the relationship between compliance and complicity. Point 28 However, if we widen the context for our discussions of complicity, if human beings are necessarily complicit, and if being complicit is distinguished from doing wrong, then our complicity with the institutional myths and with the institutional structures within which we live makes it possible for different occasions to be asked about the relationship between compliance and complicity. 4. While complicity creates us within our relations and is a condition of our responsibility to others, it is the structures of society which affect our capacity to act to avoid being complicit in wrongdoing and to do justice to others. Point 29. Those structures influence our perceptions of what is happening and create the frames which define the extent of our responsibilities to others. It is within these structures that we can identify permissible options. Within these frames, we can take only a limited number of allowable options, in which we can take only a limited set of prescribed decisions and actions. How culpable can an individual be for the harms caused to others when acting in such a context, especially if their very identity as a worker has been created by the institution in question? The structures of large institutions manipulate us, absorbing people into their self-perpetuating myths, making workers become increasingly unquestioning, unthinking, and silently immersed in a world of deniability which actively encourages them to maintain the status quo. Constrained in this way, individuals can become complicit in wrongdoing that they simply do not see, and thus cannot reasonably be expected to act against what the group prescribes. In this context it seems impossible to avoid complicity with wrongdoing. How can an individual blow the whistle, say no, that is wrong, I will not do it, when the ethics of telling and flexibility of application have become so constrained, even excluded, within the roles constructed for them, that such an option is lost. These reflections only offer some preliminary thoughts that emerge if complicity is viewed within a broader structural context, rather than in accordance with the traditional view which focuses mainly on the complicity of responsible individuals with the wrong done by others. Viewing complicity in this way allows us to understand that human beings are necessarily, rather than just occasionally and voluntarily, complicit in acts, good and bad. Complicity, thus understood, could become a way of seeing social structures as they actually operate. If there are structures in place which force people to be complicity 77. Complicit in the harming of others without giving them a reasonable chance not to be, the question of how to avoid being complicit essentially becomes a question concerned with addressing those structures, rather than one which narrowly requires the individual not to be complicit in wrongdoing. Within this broader view of complicity, to amend Primo Levi, I am not sure that you actually do have to live under extreme or excessively coercive situations in order to lose your understanding of good and bad, right and wrong, friends or enemies. Maybe you just have to be lost within a world of structural myths. Notes 1. I thank Avcentis of Sanchuk, Bob Brecker, and Michael New for their invaluable assistance and thoughtful suggestions that have contributed to the writing of this chapter. 2. The range of terms used synonymously with complicity are discussed in Kiara Lepra and Robert E. Gooden, on Complicity and Compromise, Oxford, Oxford University Press, 2013, especially CH3. 3. For example Adam Leverer, Complicity with Evil, 
The United Nations in the Age of Modern Genocide, New Haven, Yale University Press, 2008, Passive. For Judith Butler, Giving an Account of Oneself, New York, Fordham University Press, 2005, CH3. 5 Lepra and Gooden, On Complicity and Compromise, 147. 6 of it, especially CH1. 7 The term complicity dilemmas emerged from discussions with other contributors to this book. 8 Bega Mosden Firat, Sarah Demol and Sonia Van Wichelen, Commitment and Complicity in Cultural Theory and Practice, Basingstoke, Palgrave Macmillan, 2009, especially CH1. 9 Gus Owen Thomas's chapter criticizes this legal methodology exclusively. Designed to find the bad apples while paying little to no attention to the bad barrels. 10 Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, A Critique of Postcolonial Reason, Toward a History of the Vanishing Present, Cambridge, Ma, Harvard University Press, 1999, especially CH3. 11 Remagining the Past is Problematic as Many Theory of History Texts. Eighty-three, Chapter Six, Loyalty or Complicity, The Moral Assessment of Transgender, Passing in Jackie Kay's Trumpet, Cornelia Wachter, Public Moral Outrage over Passing Transgender People. One frequently presents the latter's gender performance as the morally unjustifiable concealment of the essential truth of their biological sex, leveling accusations of lying, fraud, even the entrapment of innocent others. Point two, as a corollary, the accusation of complicity is frequently directed at people who share and protect a transgender person's secret. Conversely. If transgender person's gendered experience is acknowledged as authentic or the truth, irrespective of the sex they were assigned at birth, the question of complicity does not arise in the first place. On the contrary, the accusation of complicity, in this case in Sikhism 3 or transphobia, could be leveled against those who divulge the transgender person's secret, especially if such a revelation would put the latter at risk. Accordingly, in the context of transgender passing, complicity assumes a strategic function in the attribution of moral culpability. In Paul Reynolds's words, it becomes a rhetorical tool by which we make particular arguments with a view to harnessing support and placing fault or blame at the hands of those named complicit, see also Reynolds's chapter in this book, point four these issues lie at the heart of Jackie Kay's novel Trumpet. Five when the SUC successful black Scottish jazz trumpeter Joss Moody, the novel's absent center, is posthumously outed as anatomically female, the ensuing, public and private, moral outrage is targeted at his widow Millie, the only person to have been privy to Joss's secret. Since Joss as the agent of his own gender transformation is no longer alive, his accomplice in supposed sustained deception becomes the focus of indictments. Two parties in particular are outraged by Millie's complicity, the transphobic and sensationalist tabloid press and Millie's and Joss's adoptive son Coleman, who in consequence of the revelation has come to question not only his entire relationship with his parents but also the found dashings of his own masculine identity. The present article is concerned with 84 Cornelia Wachter The moral assessment of Millie's and Joss's silence, both on the level of NAR of action and on the level of narrative transmission. As I am going to demonstrate, viewing Trumpet through the lens of complicity serves to highlight both the cultural constructedness and the deleteriousness of Sikhism. Kay's novel was inspired by the real-life story of the American jazz musician Billy Tipton, 1914-1989, who was named Dorothy Lucille Tipton at birth, lived most of his life as a man and was only discovered to be biology Cali female upon his demise. Subsequent to the revelation of Tipton's supposedly true identity, tabloid television and newspapers, as well as more reputable news formats, jumped at his life story, moreover, it was soon claimed by both lesbian slash feminist and transgendered communities. Point six Diane Wood Middlebrooks, in many ways questionable, biography suits me, the double life of Billy Tipton, 1989, serves well to exemplify the aquat. Ing of passing with deception in much public discourse. The biography is advertised in the following sensationalist terms on the verso. Suits me tells the life story of a brilliant deceiver who lived and loved in two skins, one of each sex. Billy Tipton's death made news all over the world, not because he was celebrated as a musician but because of the scale of his deception, he had been married to five women and had reared several adopted children. Point seven. The title alone suggests that Tipton's gender performance was merely donned, like a suit, and that this performance was driven by egoistic and volatile concerns, it merely suited him to assume a masculine identity. Passing is thus clearly read as deception, not as the expression of an authentic gendered identity. Accordingly, the narrative gaze which Middlebrook directs at Billy Tipton is complicit in Sikhism. In appropriating Tipton's life story, Kay made three substantial changes that are of relevance to the present analysis, first, she replaced a career that ended in the 1950s by a career commencing in the late 1950s. Middlebrook recurrently emphasizes that the jazz scene was virtually inaccessible to women at the time when Tipton embarked upon his career, and she reads Tipton's transitioning as predominantly driven by ambition. This reading corresponds to what Marjorie Garber calls a progress narrative, explaining and normalizing transavistism by interpreting it in the register of socioeco. Nomic necessity.8 Subsequent to the performance, however, the cross-dresser is supposed to resume his or her true identity. Tipton, by contrast, did not relinquish his role, not even in the marital bedroom, which renders the application of the progress narrative unconvincing. To return to Trumpet, placing the novel at a later stage in time, 
when the jazz scene may still have been patriarchal but nonetheless more permeable for women, does not allow loyalty or complicity. 85. Readerly interpretation to verge as easily towards pure ambition as the driving motivational force. Point nine. Instead, the emphasis is shifted towards the, likely, X brands of gender dissonance, the mismatch between sex assigned at birth and subconscious sex 10, as opposed to deception in the service of self-interest. Secondly, K's, absent, protagonist is not a white American but a Scotsman of mixed race heritage. Joss's ethnic background brings racially inflected constructions of gender into play and relates the issue to more general questions of identity formation and the reading of identity. In Mandy Cullen's words, the novel establishes connections between the social marginalization of people of mixed race slash nationality and trans people. Point 11 The Scottish context, moreover, evokes G. Gregory Smith's notion of the Caledonian antisysogy or strange union of opposites 12 which is often regarded as typical of Scottish literature. This connection places a conflicting gender identity on par with dualities like Scottish slash British, realism slash fantasy, or Catholic slash Protestant and thereby normalizes it in the context of Scottish literature. As for the third alteration K made, Billy Tipton's last two wives, including the mother of his adoptive children, claimed to have been unaware of Tipton's female body. By depicting a wife who was fully aware of her husband's biological features and actively participated in hiding his breasts from public scrutiny, K brings the issue of complicity into the equation, not just with regard to the public but also, more significantly, vis a vis adoptive children as the most vulnerable group to be potentially affected by the revelation of a transparent's biological sex. Judith Jack Halberstam contends that Kay's novel quietly sidesteps the equation between passing and lying and instead investigates the particular ity of desire. Point 13 While I agree that the particularity of desire is central to the narrative, I nonetheless maintain that the novel does not sidestep the question, but rather uses the polyphony of its voices to explore the relation between passing and lying. Kay prefaces her memoir Red Dust Road, 2010, with a famous quote by Helen Sixus, all biographies like all autobiographies like all narratives tell one story in place of another 14 in the fictional biography H.Y. Trumpet, rather than telling one story in place of another, K presents several stories, and the great weight placed on Millie's homodegetic narrative on the one hand and her son's homodegetic assessment of her silence on the other, render the question of complicity in passing central to the novel. Juxtaposing the perspectives of mother and son moreover highlights that Millie is caught in a complicity dilemma. Point 15 in refusing to reveal Joss's biological sex to her son, Millie's desire to protect her husband's gendered identity against the threats of transphobia collides with ideals of honesty within the nuclear family. Millie and Coleman are not the only narrative voices in the novel, whereas Joss's own perspective is all but absent from the narrative, a cacophony of 86 Cornelia Wachter. Homodegetic and heterodegetic voices serves as the basis for readers' construction of a mental image of Joss. Point 16 This entails that the reader receives no first-hand information about Joss's motivation for and experience of his transitioning. At the same time, the particularities of his wife's, his son's, and other characters' experience and perception regarding Joss's life and decease allow the reader to explore the issue from different perspectives. As I am going to demonstrate, as far as Millie's desire is concerned, its inevitable embeddedness in social space, suffused with conflicting ideologies, renders the fulfillment and protection of this desire simultaneously complicit and loyal. I will begin my analysis on the level of narrative action, with Millie's own retrospective estimation of the issue, and will then proceed to the FICS of telling 17 and the implied author's assessment of the relation between passing and lying. We first encounter Millie being harassed by the press in the wake of the public disclosure of Joss's supposedly true identity. Millie fuses hunting and war imagery in rendering her present situation, the sound of cameras appears to her like the assault of a machine gun, and she is being shot over and over again, t, 2. In consequence, she feels like an animal trapped in the headlights of a car, unable to move and defend herself. As far as these images are concerned, she introduces herself as persecuted, vulnerable and victimized by the public's ravenous interest in freaks and by the public outcry against the supposed deception inherent in passing. The hunting and war imagery not only serve to visualize Millie's own situation, but metonymically also imply the potentially far more dire consequences outing may have had for Joss during his lifetime. To relate this to the real-life situation of transgender people, Susan Stryker points out that for the supposed epistemological sin of perpetrating falsehoods that ensnare innocent and unsuspecting others, the atypically gendered must sometimes do sick pay with their lives. Point 18 The tabloid media are thus implicitly accused of complicity in sexism and transphobic violence. Fending off accusations of deceit, Millie asserts, our secret was harmless. It did not hurt anybody, t, 10, implying that neither she nor Joss were under any moral obligation to reveal that Joss was not cisgendered. Examining Millie's utterances more closely, however, immediately renders the issue more complex and raises the question of her reliability as a narrator. Millie's emphatic declarations of innocence allow for the suspicion that she may be far less sure of the moral neutrality of her actions, or lack thereof, than she professes to be. And indeed, a narrative of confession is interwoven with the persecution imagery from the very beginning, there's a film I watched once, Double Indemnity, where the guy is telling his story into a tape, dying and breathless. I feel like him, t, 1. She is referring to a 1944 film noir based on a novella by James Kane and directed by Billy Wilder. Loyalty or Complicity. 87. In which the dying protagonist Walter Neff is not just telling his story, as Millie phrases it, but confessing to a murder and an insurance fraud, as the accomplice of the victim's wife. 
The story is loosely based on a 1927 murder for which Ruth Snyder and her lover received the death penalty. The photograph Tom Howard secretly took of Snyder's execution in the electric chair became widely known, subsequent to its publication on the cover page of the New York Daily News. The issue became the largest sale of any single paper on any single day in American history, even more than when Lindbergh landed in Paris. Point 19 Although Millie hastens to add, I haven't killed anyone. I haven't done anything wrong, T. 1. Emphasis added, she has established a narrative connection between herself and Ruth Snyder, by way of the media attention, as well as between Snyder's accomplice and herself, by way of the confession. Double indemnity is moreover centrally concerned with S.U.S. Tained deception, and the parallel Millie evokes thus implicitly reads passing as deception. Millie goes on to say, if I was going to make a tape, I'd make it for Coleman, T. 1. In other words, if I feel guilty towards anyone, it is towards my son. And, indeed, we learn that her son refuses to speak to her and may never speak to her again, T. 4. Millie has to acknowledge, there must be a mistake we made. A big mistake, hiding somewhere that I somehow missed, T. 10. Tellingly, she begs, pity the fox, T. 5. Thus, her self-representation as victim directly fuses with the image of herself as perpetrator, since the fox is both the hunter's prey and a beast of prey. It is this ambivalence that I would like to explore in more detail. Because transgender people undermine common assumptions about the purportedly natural link between a particular biological sex and a particular gender, they are frequently accused of making false representations of an underlying material truth, through the willful distortion of surface appear. Ants. Their gender representation is seen as a lie rather than as an expression of a deep, essential truth, they are bad by definition 20 an individual's biological sex is presented as the inalienable truth that predetermines the right affiliation of a gender. Therefore, passing as someone of the other sex by means of a convincing gender performance is regarded as tantamount to lying. In this light, Millie's reiteration I did not lie. I did not live a lie would be untrue. Constructivist approaches, by contrast, emphasize the cultural constructedness not just of gender, but also of biological sex, which often serves as the juxtaposed natural category. As Alan Sinfield observes, even the latter is far from uncomplicated and by no means innocent of ideology. Point 21 Due to a variety of chromosomal, hormonal, and anatomical factors, not everyone is unambiguously male or female, and the meaning we ascribe to our bodies and the way they are regulated influences the way we read sex. Instead of being unambiguous and stable, sex is a mashup, a story we mix about how the body means, which parts matter most, and how they register. 88 Cornelia Wachter In our consciousness or field of vision Sex is purpose-built to serve as an epistemological construction project 22 Transgenderism has been embraced by queer studies and other post-structuralist influenced schools of thought as the personified liberation from the cultural constraints that tie our gender identities to our body's primary sexual organs, as well as from the limitations of binary categorization. However, not everyone regards the deconstruction of these binaries as liberating. In fact, there is a strong sense among many transgender people that the male-female binary does matter, and so does the ascription of an unambiguous gender identity. To quote Sinfield again, the strength of commitment of many transgendered people to the accomplishment of what they experience as their true selves may well raise new doubts about identity and social construction. 23 Whether on the basis of nature or nurture, transgender people often perceive themselves as being of the other sex and may experience the mismatch of their sense of identity and their anatomical features as painful. Point 24 In J. Prosser's words, there are transsexuals who seek very pointedly to be non-performative, to be constative, quite simply, to be 25. One of the corollaries of Joss's absence in the novel is that the reader is not privy to the origins and motivation of his transitioning. We do not know his exact motivation, we do not know whether he hid the female features of his body out of a desire to be male or out of fear of transphobic prosecution, we do not know whether he would have opted for sex reassignment surgery and hormone replacement therapy had he had the option. The reader can only piece together hypotheses on the basis of the narratives of those around Joss. Several critics have lauded the way in which Trumpet explores jazz as a trope celebrating the fluidity of identity in general and the liberating potential of reading gender as performance in particular. Lars Eckstein, for instance maintains that jazz serves as a metaphor that radically values performance and self-creation over essence and determinism 26 and Tomasz Monterey even speaks of Joss Moody's personal choice of sexual identity point 27 nevertheless, I purport that while the novel certainly celebrates the fluidity of Boundar IES and identity categories, Joss's gender performance appears to have been driven by a painful dissonance between his subconscious sex and his physical sex. For instance, as Millie describes it, Joss did not care if his bandages were uncomfortably tight, just as long as the breasts remained safely hidden, I had to help him to get dressed so that he could enjoy his day and be comfortable. T. 238. What speaks most clearly for Joss's experience of maleness as an essence is his willingness to sacrifice his life to protect his male identity, he refused to see a doctor even when he was fatally ill. T. 87. As Sandy Stone observes, the essence of transsexualism is the act of passing, 28 it means being appropriately gendered as the sex one identifies or presents oneself as point 29. Consequently, from a transgender perspective, if Joss experienced loyalty or complicity. 89 himself as male and fashioned his gender performance accordingly, he would indeed not have been lying, nor would Millie have been complicit. 
an alternative way of assessing the active concealment of Joss's breasts and his performance of a masculine identity is by means of recourse to the distinction between simulation and dissimulation. It is generally acknowledged that there is no radical difference between the two terms and that they are rather to be understood as two aspects of the same phenomenon. Point 30 Following Francis Bacon, however, the distinction can assume a moral inflection. Whereas dissimulation is read as comparatively passive and may, on those grounds, be regarded as morally justifiable, simulation is considered to be the more active form of deceptive disguise. 31 Consequently, considering Joss's gender performance as authentic would make the hiding of his breasts a dissimulation, a necessary evil practically imposed on him by constrictive soci. Adel norms, and hence morally justifiable. This ties in with the rhetorical use of complicity, since speaking of dissimulation would render Millie's complicity in the act of hiding the evidence of a female body morally excusable. Coleman and the tabloid media would, by contrast, consider Joss's gender performance to be an act of simulation, the active, deliberate, and thus morally deplorable pretense of being something he, or, from their perspective, she, is not, and Millie would be correspondingly culpable in her complicity. Whether one speaks of simulation or dissimulation, the proximity of the terms draws attention to the fact that the evidence of Joss's anatomical sex is hidden in both cases. For that reason, Joss and Millie might be accused of complicity in heteronormativity and cissexism, and the same holds true for the outraged Coleman. Indeed, apart from Joss's anatomy, the couple's courtship, their relationship, and the family they start correspond to heteronorma. Tip family ideals. As far as Millie's perspective is concerned, she met Joss as a man, she was attracted to him as a man, and she claims to have lived with him as a man, I look at the picture on the album cover, but no matter how hard I try, I can't see him as anything other than him, my Joss, my husband. It has always been that way since the first day he told me, t. 35. Considering that the subject only becomes legible, coherent, and understood, through the citation and approximation of norms already produced in the dominant discourses 32 it is not surprising that heteronormative, bourgeois values and standards provide the stabilizing framework for both Joss's performance of masculinity and Millie's sense of heterosexual normality. I managed to love my husband from the moment I clapped eyes on him till the moment he died. I managed to desire him all of our married life. I managed to respect and love his music. I managed to always like the way he ate his food. I managed to be faithful, to never be interested in another man. I managed to be loyal, to keep our private life private where it belonged. T. 206. 90. Cornelia Wachter. Even though their adoptive son Coleman points out that he was a traditional boy in an untraditional house and that his parents stuck out like a sore thumb because of his father's glamorous, unconventional profession, T. 46-47, their family life itself was conservative with clearly allocated heteronormative gender roles. This, however, might at least be partly due to the desire or even the need to be fully recognized as male and heterosexual in a world that was hostile to varieties transgressing binaries of sex, gender, and sexuality. Subsequent to Joss's death and the ensuing public revelation, however, even Millie's mourning is impeded by the ubiquity of heteronormative judgment and sensational othering that reads her not as a suffering widow but as complicit in a sustained act of moral depravity, t. 40. Joss and Millie's shared family narrative and sense of reality are being retrospectively under. Mind by public discourse. Millie bemoans, when Joss was alive, life was. Never like this. It was real. We just got on and lived it. Everything has stopped since he died. Reality has stopped, t. 153. She goes on to say, my life is a fiction now, an open book. I am trapped inside the pages of it. No doubt they will call me a lesbian. They will find words to put onto me. Words that don't fit me. Words that don't fit Joss, t. 154. Their self-life narrative has been displaced by a venomous othering narrative that expels the couple from the heteronormative frame of reference. As Hal Burstam observes, in a flurry of investigative zeal, Kay's novel shows us that a life carefully written by its author, and owned and shielded by loved ones, may suddenly stand exposed as a lie. 33 As far as the media are concerned, the narrative focus on Millie's pain serves to raise empathy on her behalf rather than subscribing to the view that her entire life was a lie. Matters, however, become more complex once we turn to boundaries of privacy within the family home, where Millie's role identities as a mother and as a wife present her with a complicity dilemma. Already at the very beginning, Millie's ambiguous predator-prey and perpetrator-victim imagery renders her emphatic statement I did not lie questionable and casts doubt on her reliability. While the focus on Joss's and Millie's experiences invites the reader to accept Joss's sexed experience or subconscious sex as the truth and hence to regard Millie's concealment of Joss's biological sex as more ally-neutral, Millie's reiteration of I did not lie is made suspect as soon as the son enters the equation, what could I tell him, that his father and I were in love, that it didn't matter to us, that we didn't even think about it after a while. I didn't think about it so how could I have kept it from him if it wasn't in my mind to keep, t. 22. James Fellon's distinction between underreporting and underreading is expedient here to examine the case. Shin of unreliability more closely. Underreporting constitutes unreliability. In that the narrator deliberately withholds necessary information. 34 they are. Loyalty or complicity. 91. Intentionally deceptive. In the privacy of the home, where the practical issues of concealing a female body were omnipresent, Millie's claim I didn't think about it suggests that she was underreporting to her son, but she is not underreporting to the reader as far as Joss's biological sex is concerned. 
what we should speak of in narratological terms is underreading, which is to say that the narrator does not consciously know, or at least is not able to admit to himself, what we infer about his personal interest. 35 I maintain that in protection of Joss's masculinity, and perhaps also Millie's own heterosexuality, Millie truly believed in the rightfulness of her actions. What she has not been able to admit to herself is that what protected her husband may have been seriously harmful to her son. As Raja Holvani points out, outing is a relational concept that involves at least three parties, the outed person, the person doing the outing, and the person receiving the information 36 outing her husband to her son would have jeopardized Joss's masculine identity and authority as a father and role model. At the same time, Millie had a responsibility to her son. Whatever Joss's and Millie's intentions and rights to privacy, the consequences for their son are manifest. When Coleman visits the morgue in an attempt to come to terms with his father's death, he is confronted with an entirely different kind of shock, the realization that his father's biological sex was female. This insight shakes not only the very foundation of his relationship to his parents, since it now appears to be suffused by deception, the new information also appears to call his own masculine identity into question, which had been molded predominantly on his father's. Coleman therefore regards Millie's silence as complicity in an unforgivable act of betrayal. In his accusation of complicity, Coleman, like the tabloid press, reproduces the heteronorma. Tiv, cis-exist order and can thus be accused of complicity in both. Jordan. B. Downing maintains that an FTM parent's transitioning to a male identity may provoke a rethinking of what it means to engage in mothering and fathering within the family, which in turn may shape how children construct their own masculinity and femininity. 37 Joss's transitioning was not witnessed by Coleman or by the reader but can only be inferred retrospectively. Nevertheless, the discrepancy between the former's apparently SUC successful fathering, including his suitability as a masculine role model 38, and his female body retrospectively provoke just such a rethinking. And indeed, Coleman ultimately comes to echo the words of real-life Tipton son Billy J.R., he'll always be dad to me 39 this leads us to the ethics of telling and the question as to how the implied author assesses the issue of passing. Coleman's pain and Millie's predator imagery suggest that it was indeed wrong of Joss and Millie not to admit their son into their confidence. At the same time, the reader learns enough about Coleman's impulsive, often violent character to render the couple's decision. 92 Cornelia Wachter. More comprehensible. Millie's own pain and suffering over the loss of her husband, the lack of recognition as a heterosexual widow and her sense of the truth of Joss's identity speak further in her favor. Moreover, after Coleman has talked to his newfound paternal grandmother, he gradually comes to reaccept his adoptive father as a father, irrespective of the latter's anatomical features. Thus, Coleman's own assessment veers towards that of his mother. This complex rendering of ethical dilemmas surrounding transgenderism in the novel is contrasted with the black and white world of tabloid journalism which takes a voracious interest in stories about deviance. The latter's complicitous gaze, which the novel clearly condemns, is metonymically represented by Sophie Stones, the journalist and biographer who aims to exploit or even cannibalize Joss's life story with Coleman's assistance. Trumpet was published at a time when, as Polly Toynbee notes, program after pro. Graham seems to have been obsessed with people of confused, indeterminate or wrong sex. Point 40 in the words of Sophie Stones, the public might hate perverts, but they love reading about them. Why? Because everybody has a bit of perversion in them, t. 264. At the beginning of Virginia Woolf's early short story memoirs of a novelist on what might be called an FICS of biography, the narrator poses the question, what right has the world to know about men and women, 41K's novel asks the same question, or, more precisely, what right has the world to know about human beings as men and as women? As far as public prying into private lives is concerned, the implied author's answer is quite clearly, none. The tabloid morality of a Sophie Stones does not conflict with Millie's owing to the authorial manipulation, which ridicules the journalist and the morality she represents. Point 42 Sophie is thus implicitly accused of complicity in sensationalism and cissexism. Moving from the ethics of telling to the ethics of writing, the question arises as to whether Kay may also be regarded as complicit in the very sensationalism her novel accuses the tabloid media of. I would argue that especially since Kay refuses to grant us the details the tabloid public might be craving, because she raises rather than answers questions about gendered truths and their corollaries, she avoids precisely that. To examine complicity and the ethics of writing in more general terms, Jeffrey Hartman maintains that spying is complicity raised to an art, and, the novelist is a socially tolerated spy in league with many of our cruder instincts. Point 43 k similarly wonders in Red Dust Road, maybe all writers have something creepy about them, creeping about the place trying to find out and put into words things that should be left silent as Stone 44 due to the fact that Kay appropriates. Rather than simply adapts Tipton's life story, her narrative gaze is not so much directed at Tipton himself but at transgenderism in general. I would. Loyalty or complicity. 93. Like to borrow Linda Hutchins' term complicitous critique 45 in this context to indicate that Trump it is, on the one hand, an obvious critique of heteronormativity and cissexism and the complicitous gaze directed at those who deviate from the norm. At the same time, however, in its curiosity about the ethical dilemma surrounding transgenderism, the novel is inevitably also complicit in precisely what it criticizes, and a certain degree of complicity may be unavoidable in the full realization of a character, even if this char actor is, like Joss, formed as part of narrative ideology critique. I nonetheless maintain that while Kay does creep about the place of transgenderism, she does so without catering to our cruder instincts in the way her own fictional journalist does in Trumpet. 
To conclude, Trumpet illustrates that complicity can not only lie in the transgression of social norms but also in conformance, in this case in the affirmation of heterosexism and cissexism. In general terms, the novel clearly assumes a critical position vis-a-vis -vis constrictive social norms of identity construction. As far as the public is concerned, it conveys in no uncertain terms that a transgender person's anatomical features are none of anyone's business, and prying and persecution are unambiguously condemned. Within the realm of intimate personal relations, however, the novel represents matters as far more complex. While Millie may have been convinced that she had not been withholding the truth, since her truth was Joss's experience rather than anatomical sex, her son's evident pain forces her to reassess her silence. Her own pain as a widow and the suffering caused by being deprived of a widow's space and recognition for mourning at the same time invite empathy with her perspective. Thus, the ambivalence which shines through Millie's narrative raises important questions about the ethical implications of gender and sexuality, about the relation between passing and lying, about identity and truth. Trumpet negotiates rather than draws the line between telling the truth and lying as far as passing is concerned. In the end, both the characters and the critics' discussion serve to illustrate just how difficult it is to shake off a binary logic and the belief in authenticity when it comes to sex and gender. In the words of Paul Ricoeur, telling a story is deploying an imaginary space for thought experiments in which moral judgment operates in hypothetical mode 46 in Trumpet, K provides just such a space, and complicity as a diagnostic lens reveals cissexism as a structural problem. Accordingly, the novel echoes Stryker's call to articulate and disseminate new epistemological frameworks, and new representational practices, within which variations in the sex-slash-gender relationship can be understood as morally neutral and representationally true. Point 47 In such an environment, the question of Millie's complicity would not have arisen in the first place, nor would there have been cause for Coleman's pain. 94 Cornelia Wachter Notes 1. I use scare quotes to indicate that transgender passing implies that there exists an unambiguously identifiable biological sex, proclaimed as the truth, which determines the right affiliation of gender, rather than viewing the trans person's gender performance as truthful and authentic in its own right. Following Susan Stryker, I am going to speak of transgender as denoting a wide range of phenomena that call attention to the fact that gender, as it is lived, embodied, experienced, performed, and encountered, is more complex and varied than can be accounted for by the currently dominant binary sex-slash-gender ideology of Eurocentric modernity. Susan Stryker, the Subjugated Noel Edge, An Introduction to Transgender Studies, in the Transgender Studies Reader, ed. Susan Stryker and Stephen Whittle, New York, Routledge, 2006, 3. 2 C.F. Talia May Betcher, Evil Deceivers and Make Believers, on Transphobic Violence and the Politics of Illusion, Hypatia 22, 2007, 43-65. 3. Cissexism is the ideology which naturalizes the idea that biological sex is unambiguously binary and that the sex assigned at birth determines one's gender identity. In Julia Serrano's words, in her preface to the second edition of Whipping Girl, it is the double standard that promotes the idea that transsexual genders are distinct from, and less legitimate than, cissexual genders. Julia Serrano, Whipping Girl, Emeryville, Seal Press, 2016, 18. For Paul Reynolds, What is Complicity, and Who is Complicit in Democratic Societies? Paper presented at the Complicity Conference, University of Brighton, March 31st to April 1st, 2015. 5. Jackie K., Trumpet, London, Picador, 1998, 3. In the following abbreviated as T. 6. Nan A. Boyd, Bodies in Motion, Lesbian and Transsexual Histories, in a Queer World, the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies Reader, ed. Martin B. Duberman, New York, New York University Press, 1997, 139. 7. Diane W. Middlebrook, Suits Me, the Double Life of Billy Tipton, Boston. Houghton Mifflin, 1998, emphasis added. 8. Marjorie B. Garber, Vested Interests, Cross-Dressing and Cultural Anxiety, New York, Routledge, 1992, 69. 9. Mandy Cullen, Masculine Transformations in Jackie Kay's Trumpet, Atlantis 35, 2010, 72. 10. Julia Serrano, Whipping Girl, Emeryville, Seal Press, 2016, 27. 11. Cullen, Masculine, 72. 12. Gregory G. Smith, Scottish Literature, Character and Influence, London, Macmillan, 1919, 4. 13. Judith Halberstam, In a Queer Time. Ed. Peter Hoon, E.T.A.L., Hamburg, Hamburg University, 2014, Access June 6, 2016, H. 99. Chapter 7. Navigating Complicity in Contemporary Feminist Discourse. G. Juliana Monteverdi. This chapter looks at complicity in relation to contemporary feminist discourse, and makes some suggestions regarding how this should be approached, and in what context. I begin by providing some background as to why complicity is relevant in relation to feminism, first by looking at previous feminisms, and then at aspects of current, or more recent feminisms. Point one I then summarize three ways feminists invoke or incorporate complicity in their writing, politics, practices, and framework. Ultimately, this chapter parses the questions, why talk about complicity and feminism? Why are they relevant to one another? How do we go about discussing them? 
I suggest that reflecting upon complicity is a useful way of navigating post-feminist neoliberalism and the ways in which we are all interlocked with one another. Being open to recognizing our own complicity, within an intersectional and structural understanding of power and oppression, then, can help us to see complicity more clearly. It is essential to reiterate from the beginning of this chapter that the case that must permeate throughout feminist discussions of complicity is, complicit with what? I would suggest that continually posing the question complicit with what, is perhaps more important than seeking any definitive answer on complicity, especially because of the multifaceted nature of feminism. Broadly, I am referring to complicity with white supremacist, capitalist, heteronormative patriarchy, to paraphrase bell hooks, too but it remains pertinent that this means different things to different people, for example some feminists see sex work as inherently oppressive, and others don't. When saying someone or something is complicit, then, there needs to be sufficient context and understanding of the myriad ways feminisms have approached certain topics. Following from Paul Reynolds in this collection, I propose. Using complicity as a political tool rather than as a concept with a stable. 100 G. Juliana Monteverdi. Definition. Understanding complicity in this way enables us to critique white supremacist, capitalist, heteronormative patriarchy from a variety of angles and perspectives, and to also acknowledge our participation and agency in reproducing these systems. In my own work I look at complicity with post-feminist neoliberal discourses about beauty, beauty as tool for self-improvement, beauty as nasi sorry for all women, beauty as only about women, beauty as only relating to normative standards, beauty through relentless purchase of products, white complicity in perpetuating racism, I do this by analyzing white pop stars' responses to accusations of racism, including Miley Cyrus, Iggy Azalea, and Lily Allen, complicity in upholding white middle class, cishet conceptions of motherhood and marriage, and complicity in utilizing feminism within a neoliberal corporate context, as done by Sheryl Sandberg in Lean In. Ultimately there is no blueprint for how to use complicity within a feminist context, but for me it's imperative to be self-reflexive about the potential effects of analyzing certain practices, keeping in mind the groups affected by such analysis. Feminism needs a discourse on complicity because inhabiting a particular identity position doesn't neatly map onto political outlook, or individual behavior. This is not to say it never does, because this would remove the legitimacy of lived experience, understanding something in a certain way because it relates to your life as part of an identity group, like women, and sexual harassment, and the important recognition of privilege when it relates to identity position, being aware of race, class, able-bodied privilege. My argument is that identity position, political outlook, and personal behavio you do not always go hand in hand, and that this leads to the possibility of complicity. Whereas many women have lived experience of sexual harass. Meant, some women do not. Some women don't link experiences of sexual harassment with wider insights about gender politics, and some women may argue on popular radio phone-in programs that catcalling is flattering or not a big deal. It's possible then, and really quite likely, that some women are complicit with participating in a discourse that trivializes experiences of street harassment as misogynistic, e.g. Furthermore, people whose identity positions do go hand in hand with their political outlook, e.g. a woman who is a feminist because of her experience and understanding of being a woman and how that relates to gender inequality y, can be complicit with behaviors and discourses that harm women. This has been the case throughout feminist histories where privileged women have acted in ways that have been detrimental to women of color, queer women, or working class women. Moreover, a feminist woman who participates in intersectional feminist discourse or activism will also find herself saying or thinking things that she recognizes as prejudicial. Point three bell hooks reminds us. Navigating complicity in contemporary feminist discourse 101. We have all, irrespective of race, sex, or class, acted in complicity with the existing oppressive system for with an understanding of our de facto complex ity with hierarchical and oppressive ideologies, we can check ourselves, and be aware of how we move through the world and affect others. My broader point here, and one that has been made before, is that women can be sexist, racist and homophobic, or hold any range of views. In this chapter I advocate a feminist discourse on this complicity, but not just when it refers to women over there or some women as I have just phrased it, but also to less obvious cases of complicity, and to our own, feminist, complicity. The practice of this discourse of complicity would not simply be to say, X is complicit, but to have a contextual and intersectional conversation about what is being discussed, and the politics involved in invoking complicity. From what position is X complicit? According to whom? Can X practice be? Seen as positive and negative, as more than just good or bad. The discourse of complicity that I advocate then is not always about blame, it is more about opening up spaces and advocating nuance.5 in order to demonstrate that feminisms have recurrently conceived of women in a fixed way, I will look at some examples of feminist essentialism, ultimately arguing that the move away from this creates more space for a discourse on complicity. Why complicity? Previous feminisms and essentialism. The gradual move from essentialism in feminism, to contemporary feminisms that work from, or towards, an intersectional perspective, in part justifies an exploration of complicity. Some feminisms have relied upon essentialist constructions of womanhood, and encouraged solidarity on the basis of an imagined sisterhood. These feminist theories and concurrent forms of activism were built on notions of a shared womanhood, sometimes in biologistic terms, sometimes not, or a universalized female experience that often excluded women that weren't white, middle class, able-bodied, cisgendered or straight. Feminists have articulated essential womanhood in a variety of ways. 
Some first wave suffragettes argued that women had a natural disposition toward maternity and domesticity and should be granted the vote because their moral superiority would improve society as a whole. Point six, whereas many second wave feminists didn't subscribe to essentialism in theoretical terms. Discursively and practically, they related particular theories of oppression to an idea of what it was to be woman. Many second wave radical feminists wrote about women's oppression in relation to their bodies. Shulamith Firestone refers to women as a sex class. 102 G. Juliana Monteverdi. In the dialectic of sex, 1970, stating that the natural reproductive difference between men and women means that women throughout history have been at the continual mercy of their biology. Point seven in against our will, men, women, and rape. Susan Brown Miller refers to man's structural capacity to rape and woman's corresponding structural vulnerability, thus connecting anatomy with power relations, and eventually stating that all men keep all women in a state of fear. Point eight whereas bodies still figure prominently in feminist theory, they are not presumptively assigned to categories of gender and biological sex based solely on anatomy. For Brown Miller, simply having a penis or a vagina gives a person a particular fixed role when it comes to oppression or unequal power dynamics, she presents bodies as natural, rather than as having various meanings within a social system of ideas. Point nine this move away from bodies with fixed meaning means complicity can be attributed to a variety of bodies. Cressida Highs refers to four types of essentialism, which Alison Stone summarizes as follows. 1. Metaphysical essentialism, the belief in real essences, of the sexes, which exist independently of social construction. 2. Biological essentialism, the belief in real essences which are biological in character. 3. Linguistic essentialism, the belief that the term woman has a fixed and invariant meaning. And 4. Methodological essentialism, which encompasses approaches to studying women's, or men's, lives which presuppose the applicability of gender as a general category of social analysis. Point 10. Following from this, while many second-wave feminists didn't subscribe to metaphysical or biological essentialism, they did often utilize linguistic or methodological essentialism. They assumed women had a particular meaning, or wrote about women in a way that suggested this, and they invoked a shared female experience that was often actually a white, middle-class, straight, cisgendered, able-bodied experience. In 1977, the Combahee River Collective statement declared that no one before has ever examined the multilayered texture of black women's lives. Point 11 The collective, among other things, stated that separatism, as advocated by some radical lesbian feminists, was not an option for them, because they needed to organize in solidarity with men of color against racism. The statement explicitly rejects biological determinism, calling it a particularly dangerous and reactionary basis upon which to build a politic bell hooks. Writing in 1984, said feminists must fight to end racism and classism as well. As sexism. Her definition of feminism as a movement to end sexist oppression acknowledges that all people, including women, can be sexist, and her work advocates that men take responsibility for sexism and ultimately become feminist allies. Point 12. Navigating complicity in contemporary feminist discourse 103. Both of these black feminist examples show the complexity of feminist subjectivity. Black feminism shows that the experience of womanhood presented by white feminists is not universal. As feminisms move from essentialism to intersectionality, more and more space emerges for differing, potentially conflicting, subjectivities. Because feminism talks about people from different perspectives and with varying power relations in mind, we are able to recognize a woman oppressed in one sense and oppressor in another. It is this movement towards varying subjectivities and positionalities that enables a feminist turn towards complicity. It is possible and increasingly more important to face complicity as we continue to acknowledge our interlocking relations with one another in terms of power and privilege. Feminist work on intersectionality and kiriarchy, the former developed by critical race scholar Kimberla Crenshaw, and the latter by feminist Theo. G. and Elizabeth Schessler Fiorenza, acknowledges the ways that systems of Oppression intersect to create varied experiences of power and powerlessness. Schessler Fiorenza refers to the complex interstructuring of patriarchal dominations inscribed within women and in relationships of dominance and subordination between women. Point 13 If we are able to acknowledge we may be both oppressor and oppressed, or oppressed in differing ways according to situation, environment, and identity position, feminist theories of complicity and conversations about complicity can build upon this acknowledgement to develop strategies to overcome it. Universalized notions of female experience and biologically essentialist constructions of women still exist, both in and outside of feminism. Trans-exclusionary radical feminists, commonly referred to as TERFs, rely upon biological definitions to define womanhood, and liberal feminist discourses of having it all often rely on a white cis middle class conception of motherhood and work. Additionally, mainstream media outlets frequently represent feminism as being about women in general, but focus on images and issues that most relate to the lives of more privileged women. These same outlets frequently suggest that being a successful woman is synonymous with being a feminist, this is often the case with female politicians and celebrities, and that feminisms are in favor of the actions of every woman. It is often considered unfeminist for women to criticize other women, despite a long feminist history of disagreement, uncomfortable analysis, and dissent. Feminisms can still be essentialist, biologically and linguistically, and the categories woman and feminist are often combined in ways that don't particularly make sense in light of feminist histories. The move towards intersectionality then doesn't mean that all contemporary feminists with an understanding of it have completely decolonized their minds or adjusted their practice 14 but that feminisms aren't conceived of by feminists as being simply pro-women and anti-men. Whereas many second-wave feminist texts 
104 G. Juliana Monteverdi. Did ask questions regarding complicity, often they discursively constructed all women as victims and all men as perpetrators of sexism. In doing this, men are presented as always dominant and women as always dominated, whereas this is not the case when we acknowledge factors such as race, sexual orientation, religion, nationality, ability, and so on. This second wave construction excluded the experiences of many, and obscured power relations between groups. Second wave white feminists often didn't account for the class and slash or race privilege white women have over men from marginalized communities, whereas contemporary feminists speak in terms of systems of privilege, and refer to more complex subjectivities and positionalities. The subsequent complication, blurring or merging of categories is what facilitates a consideration of complicity. In other words, when feminism was, regrettably, constructed around more simplistic subject positions, complicity was less visible. For example, radical feminist group The Reds Talkings wrote in 1969 about the pro-woman line, which was a theory that stated, women as oppressed people act out of necessity, act dumb in the presence of men, not out of choice. 15. While this theory is open-minded and understanding of the fact that women are raised within patriarchy, it doesn't account for the ways privileged women can act in ways that are oppressive to less privileged women, or less privileged men, and it doesn't allow for women who actively work to limit other women's choices, I'm thinking in terms of reproductive rights but this can apply to other areas too. The pro-woman line, and theories like it, obfuscate the possibility of complicity. They don't allow the possibility of women being complicit in upholding intersectional forms of oppression because they present women as always surviving within patriarchy, rather than as inhabiting different subject positions within kiriarchy. The development of feminist discourse, theory, and politics has opened up space for more perspectives, more vantage points and so a more complex view of feminisms that allow for some discussion of complicity. There has been a move from essentialism in feminist discourse, and the use of a white privileged subject to stand in for all women, to a more widespread understanding of intersectionality. Mary Maynard, writing about the changes between second and third wave feminisms, says, the self is no longer conceived in rationalistic, monolithic, and homogeneous terms but as fragment, pluralistic, eroticist and as continually changing. Point 16 because the self is seen as a culmination of contradictions and conflicts, it is fitting that feminism looks toward complicity, not as a means of blame, but a further and more nuanced understanding. This section looked at examples of essentialism in previous feminisms as an example of how feminisms were constructed around more stable subject positions. While acknowledging that contemporary feminisms still do this in Navigating complicity in contemporary feminist discourse 105. Some ways, I contend that the move away from this provides space to look at complicities within feminism. Black feminist critiques of white centric second wave feminisms were recognition of white women's complicity with white supremacy, as were working class critiques of middle class privilege, and queer critiques of heteronormativity and homophobia within feminisms. In the next section, I will argue that the current political and cultural landscape also lends itself to a feminist study of complicity. Why complicity? Contemporary feminisms, post feminism, and neoliberalism. In the aftermath of feminism, Angela McRobbie describes post-feminism as an environment in which elements of feminism have been taken into account 17 but are simultaneously seen as irrelevant and a thing of the past. The assimilation of post-feminist language and imagery into capitalist contexts, like those that utilize the language of empowerment, independence, and choice, further complicate the subject categories of feminism. McRobbie suggests women and girls are offered certain kinds of empowerment, through consumption, certain performed sexualities, access to education and employment, as a substitute for feminist politics and transformation. Point 18 in their book New Femininities, Gill and Scharf summarize several interpretations of post-feminism, indicating that it can have elements of retrosexism, backlash and a sense of the pastness of feminism. Point 19 Most importantly however, they identify post-feminism as a sensibility, which includes the notion that femininity is increasingly figured as a bodily property, a shift from objectification to subjectification in the ways that, some, women are represented, an emphasis upon self-surveillance, monitoring and discipline, a focus upon individualism, choice, and empowerment, the dominance of a makeover paradigm, a resurgence of ideas of natural sexual difference, the marked resexualization of women's bodies, and an emphasis upon consumerism and the commodification of difference. Point 20. Many popular representations of gender operate from this post-feminist vantage point and so feminist ideas and language are often operationalized for commercial end. Because of this, there is an ongoing debate in popular and alternative media outlets about what is feminist and what isn't, who is feminist and who isn't. Complicity figures here because this debate relies upon simplistic assumptions about what feminism is and what a feminist looks like, as well as maintaining a binary of feminist and not, rather than a spectrum of feminism that might be more appropriate when describing female politicians. 106 G. Juliana Monteverdi Or musicians This debate tries to assign complicity but does so within a medium that's designed to attract clicks and sell advertising space, rather than one interested in what it means to be a feminist, and what it means to live as one. This overly simplistic slew of hot takes doesn't fit with feminist discourse itself, illustrated by the fact that many feminist tweets and memes mock it, for example, is pop star a feminist? Is MasterCard a queer ally? Is this TV show my friend? 21 Is woman smart to do sex work? Can college student prostitute? Is hooker business person? 22 McCrobby's description of post-feminism, written in 2009, talked about sex and the city and Bridget Jones's diary, both of which contained girl power or strong woman tropes. Today, 
many pop culture figures and texts actually use the word feminist and actively address what they perceive feminist issues to be. McRobbie acknowledges this in a 2015 article, where she says, feminism once again has a presence across the quality and popular media, and similarly in political culture and in civil society 23 where the Spice Girls had girl power and Destiny's Child celebrated independent women, Beyoncé now stands in front of huge letters spelling out feminist, and Miley Cyrus proclaims herself one of the biggest feminists in the world 24 and really empowering to women. Point 25 Harry Potter actress Emma Watson has a feminist book club, the Women's Equality Party is the fastest growing party in the United Kingdom 26. And Sheryl Sandberg, who of Facebook, describes her business book as a feminist manifesto. Point 27 This isn't a value judgment on the feminist credentials of these examples, because there are significant differences between them, but rather an illustration of the current popularity of feminist imagery, language, and ideas in mainstream pop culture. Feminism as fashionable is another reason to develop discourses of complicity, nuanced. Depictions of agency and subjectivity are an intervention into media nera. Tips that restrict feminisms to the simplistic subject positions and narratives they have increasingly been moving away from. These discourses can counter media presentations of feminism as being about men versus women, feminists hating men, feminism as solely about gender or sex, and so on. Using a feminist language that incorporates complicity, in a respectful and contextual manner, can appreciate the importance and power of Beyoncé's visual album Lemonade, especially for black women, and also understand Bell Hook's critique of it within the context of capitalism. Complicity as a feminist tool lets us defend Miley Cyrus from slut-shaming, but allows us to criticize her vehemently for cultural appropriation, it enables us to see Sheryl Sandberg's success as a businesswoman and to deconstruct her use of feminist language, imagery, and ideas. I've already noted that feminism is becoming increasingly fashionable. Literally, as Forever 21 and H&M have released feminist sweatshirts, and Chanel's 2014 catwalk show used imagery of feminist protest, complete. Navigating complicity in contemporary feminist discourse 107. With supermodels holding placards, but feminism has been used to appeal to female customers for quite some time. The language and imagery of feminism is used to sell cosmetics, hygiene products, and sportswear. Sure deodorant says, women are strong, Pantene tells women to hashtag shine strong, and Dove's ongoing campaign for real beauty includes a recent advert where women are asked to choose between two doors labeled beautiful and average. This capitalist recuperation of feminism means it can be taken into account 28 and recognized by the consuming audience, but remain isolated from its more radical and collective messages. This increased accessibility of diluted feminist ideas means feminism is available to more subjects, but often not politicized ones. So feminism is more fashionable, and the language of feminism is utilized in various settings, in the service of profit and brand enhancement. This bolsters the need for a feminist language of complicity because feminism becomes increasingly merged with consumerist post-feminist culture, which many of us interact with via social media, through our affinity for particular celebrities and artists, and by means of TV shows like Girls, The Mindy Project and Broad City, which actively incorporate post-feminist themes and coy feminist awareness. As feminism rises to the surface of mainstream discourse and pop culture representations, we should advocate a multidimensional approach. We need to talk about complicity because feminism is getting more popular, but there is also something about the type of feminism being promulgated that relates to complicity. When Lena Dunham and Mindy Kaling are interacting with feminist themes, whether that is female independence, creativity, and authorship, representations of bodies and nudity, depiction of women of color on television, it's expedient to have a language of complicity that can accept and appreciate the favorable aspects of their work on some fronts, and also recognize their shortcomings, and their complicities. With certain perspectives, both women have been criticized and praised from a feminist standpoint, and Kaling has commented on how being viewed in terms of her gender and race limits her as a female artist. Neoliberalism also intersects with post-feminism and complicity, individualist gendered narratives encourage female success within existing capitalist paradigms, rather than collective political resistance to prevailing gender norms. Neoliberal rationality spills over, and often fits neatly into, discussions on, and representations of feminism, particularly when it comes to representations of choice and power. Aspects of this neoliberal rationality, such as self as project, self-branding, individualism, personal responsibility and an economic rationale apply to all aspects of public and private life, lead to an understanding of feminism as being solely about choice, or as being a tool for individual power and advancement because of savvy self. Management. With a feminist language of complicity, feminists can respond. 108 G. Juliana Monteverdi. To the neoliberalization of feminist discourse, particularly to those privileged women who take up the mantle of gender equality to advance themselves. Post-feminist neoliberalism also interacts with consumerist discourses, so that consumption becomes a method for creating and disciplining the self. In Technologies of Sexiness, Adrian Evans and Sarah Riley discuss the ways in which subjectivities are formed through disciplinary neoliberal governance, while appearing to be freely chosen. A range of subject positions are created, where people are able to draw on a series of discourses about the self in order to create the self. These subject positions hail us in some way, so that through various processes of internalization we take them up and make them our own. Taking up the various articulations of neoliberal subjectivity may thus feel choiceful, but they reiterate neoliberal constructions of ideal subjectivity, so that neoliberal subjectivity becomes a taken-for-granted understanding. Point 29. 
and awareness of the pervasiveness of neoliberal rationality is necessary to understand the ways it affects our sense of choice and agency. It's important that many feminisms are actively hostile to, or seriously critical of, neoliberalism, partly due to its increasing reach into feminism, exemplified by Facebook coup Sheryl Sandberg who tells women to lean into their careers, or Hillary Clinton who refers to women as the largest untapped reservoir of talent in the world. Point 30 Neoliberal post-feminism provides a contested and subjective viewpoint from which to read gender. Groups like Women Against Feminism 31 Conservative Women 32 and Meninists 33 are visible on social media, and celebrity women speak out for or against what they perceive feminism to be, this is an ever-growing list that includes Taylor Swift, Meryl Streep and Miley Cyrus. There are feminists who disagree on hot topic issues like the No More Page 3 Campaign 34 or the 2015 Amnesty decision to support the Decriminalization of Sex Work. There are feminists who don't recognize other feminists as feminists, for example, Separatist radical feminist Sheila Jeffries says there was never a third wave, only backlash.35 Conversely, many intersectional feminists CTERFs or sex worker exclusionary radical feminists, SWERFs, as bigots and bullies. A feminist position on complicity then is necessary not only in light of changing feminist discourses from the second to the third and fourth wave, but also because of the current cultural landscape. If feminism changed between the second and third waves, in terms of issues seen as important, the women involved in feminist conversations, the medium of those conversations, changes in how power relations are conceived, changes in what is studied and in what light, the current political and cultural landscape. Navigating complicity in contemporary feminist discourse 109. Provides a particularly complex and messy terrain in terms of gender politics, representations, feminist consensus, and dissent. It is in light of this particular feminist landscape that I ask where complex ITY fits and how it might be approached. I reiterate that a feminist discourse of complicity must also point us towards recognizing our own actions as potentially complicit, whether that be in foregrounding some issues over others, offering opinion on experiences we are uninformed about or actively behaving in discriminatory or ignorant ways. This section has presented contemporary neoliberal post-feminism as being conducive to conversations on complicity, both because feminism is more fashionable, and because the individualized, choice-heavy rhetoric of neoliberal post-feminism presents feminist language and imagery to an often a political audience. I will now look at how feminists have already pointed to complicity and make some comment on the different ways they do this. Complicities and feminisms, politics, practices, and framework. There is a latent discourse of complicity in feminist discourse, wherein feminists invoke complicity in a number of ways. I have divided feminist dealings with complicity into three broad categories, politics, practices, and feminist framework, though, as expected, there are significant overlaps from one category into another.36. Feminisms and political complicities. To begin with, we look at complicity with political systems. Feminists that mention complicity in terms of politics tend to be referring to women's interactions with capitalism, consumerism, and neoliberalism. Because of this there can be a crossover with practices. For example, Maria Mize in Patriarchy and Accumulation on a Global Scale points to white women's complicity in the exploitation of women of color in the Global South. She uses complicity to refer to political systems, neocolonialism, capitalism, consumerism, but also to the practice of shopping. She says, Women are not only victims of capitalist patriarchy, they are also, in varying degrees and qualitatively different forms, collaborators with the system. This is particularly true for middle-class women worldwide, and for the white women in industrialized countries.37. For Mize, while privileged white women are oppressed in myriad and differing ways, they are also complicit in the oppression of less privileged women. 110 G. Juliana Monteverdi. This is also true of white women when it comes to cultural appropriation and microaggressions, as well as in other forms of prejudicial behavior relating to class, race and so on. Criticisms of other feminists, or pointing to feminist complicity, is also usually done in relation to politics, and directed towards feminists who have not decentered or decolonized their perspective. Nina Power also sees complicity in relation to political systems or ideologies. She points out the inevitability of complicity within capitalism, and points to the effective labor often undertaken by women in service industries. I'd begin by suggesting that in many ways it is impossible not to be complicit in some sense with capitalism and capitalist culture, almost everyone has to seek employment in order to pay for rent, food etc. The way in which employment demands a certain kind of worker means that people are forced to play roles they might not want to play, the smiling receptionist, for example.38. For power, political complicities, and the emotional and linguistic behaviors that go along with them, are almost impossible to avoid. Similarly, in this collection, Thomas Docherty refers to political complicities in the context of academic freedom, and the difficulties and limits of stepping away from that which you don't agree with. If managerialist fundamentalism is the dominant language of the tribe, then in order to be employable, a left-wing feminist academic, for example, has to take on the voice and message of marketers, and make a CV by converting her life experiences into the very neoliberal logic she rails against. In choosing to not do this, to not be complicit, she would be outside the institution of the university and thus have less opportunity to write and teach about strategies for resisting, critiquing and deconstructing neoliberal rationalities. In this context, it's difficult to avoid complicity, and advantageous to be strategically complicit in the short term. Invocations of feminist complicity also happen between various strands of feminism, 
with some feminists seeing liberal feminism as complicit with cor poritism, as articulated in criticisms of Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In, particularly Don Foster's recent book Lean Out, 39 Radical Feminism as complicit with gender essentialism, TERFs often see trans people as reefing traditional gender roles, but many feminists see radical feminists themselves as being biologically essentialist because of their focus on women born women, 40 Intersectional Feminism as complicit with the normalization of the sex industry 41 Twitter Feminism as complicit with policing discourse, Michelle Goldberg's article Feminism's Toxic Twitter Wars in the Nation made this criticism, which has been supported and decried by many other writers, 42 and so on. This raises an important point about complicity when it relates to feminist discourse, it is highly debatable what can be considered feminist or navigating complicity in contemporary feminist discourse 111. Not, and therefore whether someone is complicit or not. As I have reiterated throughout this chapter, this very difficultly makes it necessary to always be contextual and thorough when invoking complicity and to be clear about the feminist position one is working from point 43. Feminisms and complicity through practices. When talking about complicity with regard to practices, the distinction between what can be considered feminist and what can't is pertinent. Feminists may suggest that some women are complicit because of their interaction with a particular practice. This is most often the case in liberal feminism with sensationalist topics such as pole dancing, overtly sexual self-presentation or cosmetic surgery. Other feminist work complicates a simple relationship between complicity and practices by pointing to the agency of women who choose to engage in a particular practice, the multiple contexts in which women may undertake a practice or the changing meaning of practices themselves. Evans and Riley try to find a middle ground between women's enjoyment of certain practices and maintaining a feminist critique of them, in their case, through a study of how women make sense of and come to take on the sensibilities of post-feminism, neoliberalism and consumerism. When it comes to sexuality.44 work like this presents a more nuanced picture of complicity, one where it may be considered unreasonable or unhelpful to call an individual complicit because of his or her interaction with a practice seen as not feminist. Feminist discussions of complicity relating to practices have the potential to be judgmental or moralistic, and are complicated by the fact that practices can be read in a variety of ways. It is often the case that white women's experiences or histories of a particular practice come to stand in for the experiences of other women. For example, feminists of color have reiterated the different sexual stereotypes facing women of color, and queer feminists have pointed out the ways queer people may use beauty practices as a subversion of existing gender hierarchies. It's important then to situate a practice before going on to condemn it as bad for women, whatever that might mean. As I have hopefully made clear, feminism is an amorphous, ever-evolving, multifaceted political position that is taken up and expressed by people from a multitude of positions, and this is by no means a negative trait. A whole host of practices and beliefs have been described as the epitome of freedom, empowerment, or resistance, and as the worst kind of oppressive misogyny. The question that must permeate throughout feminist discussions of complex IT why then, is, complicit with what? As mentioned at the beginning of this chapter, I would suggest that continually posing the question complicit with what, is more important than seeking a definitive answer on complicity. 112 G. Juliana Monteverdi. Especially because of the nature of feminism. If each interaction with questions of complicity and feminism comes from a situated position, from a specified framework, with a certain set of laid out assumptions, with context and understanding of a practice or belief, then accusations or invocations of complicity can be tied to whatever discussion is at hand, rather than to all people who undertake a particular practice. Complicity and Feminist Framework The final category in which feminists invoke or address complicity is in their formulation of feminism itself. These feminists mention complicity in their definitions of feminism, or when they set out their framework. In Feminism Without Women, Tanya Modelsky stresses that everyone is complicit. She says. Today, we are in danger of forgetting the crucial fact that like the rest of the world even the cultural analyst may sometimes be a cultural dupe, which is, after all, only an ugly way of saying that we exist inside ideology, that we are all victims, down to the very depths of our psyches, of political and cultural domination, even though we are never only victims, point 45. Similarly, in Feminism is for Everybody, Bell Hooks says, we have all, irrespective of race, sex, or class, acted in complicity with the existing oppressive system. We must all make a conscious break with the system 46 both writers understand complicity as a starting point for feminist writing, research or politics, and through this understanding place themselves alongside the women they write about. I have taken on this use of complicity in this chapter, I have incorporated de facto complicity into my feminist approach, and will now address my own potential complicities. Conclusion, Considering Complicity Having touched upon the ways feminists can invoke complicity, I want to summarize some considerations I have raised throughout this chapter. When considering complicity and feminisms, it is, first, important to work from an understanding of feminism as having multiple perspectives and approaches with various histories, as an evolving and non-hierarchical movement, and as a self-reflexive discourse that is always in conversation with itself. Following from this, when talking about practices, and whether someone is complicit because of their following a practice, there must be a context offered for that practice, and an appreciation that humans are agentic subjects within certain ideological parameters and political systems, inhabiting rationalities but with the capacity to impinge on each other's ability to live life in certain ways. Navigating Complicity in Contemporary Feminist Discourse 113 and with the power to resist and subvert. A practice such as makeup use can be described as creative, resistant, subversive, and conformist, 
depending on the context and approach used. This doesn't make complicity a useless theoretical tool for feminism, but a flexible one. It is also important to be aware that particular practices are linked with particular groups of women, and focusing on a practice may serve to further police women that are already marginalized. To take the example of makeup use again, condemning its users as complicit with patriarchy, or with a sexist beauty system, places further scrutiny on women who are often already considered superficial and vacuous because of their particular gender performance. Talking about makeup use as if it's a practice only undertaken by cisgendered heterosexual white women obscures the ways queer women, women of color, men, and gender nonconforming people use makeup. It is important then to frame discussions of complicity in such a way that totalizing narratives about certain practices aren't applied unduly. This would have sinister effects on already marginalized women if the practice discussed was sex work for example. It is worth considering how feminist work on complicity can be interpreted and used by others in ways that are potentially disadvantageous or harmful. Point 47 Do discussions of complicity encourage misogynistic proclamations, racist comments, or CLASist conclusions? If so, how can this be prevented? Finally, it's essential that whoever is writing about complicity is cognizant of their own potential complicity in reinforcing certain narratives about particular practices or groups of people. In my case, I am a white middle class, cisgendered straight woman, positioned within an academic institution, and so while I have endeavored to reflect the experiences and concerns of others, it's likely that I am nonetheless complicit in privileging certain perspectives over others. Ultimately, this chapter has argued for a feminist discourse of complicity in light of previous and present feminisms, and has outlined some already existing uses of complicity. It is essential that a feminist discourse of complicity takes place in a contextual, intersectional, and respectful manner, with an acknowledgement that we all start from a position of complicity. Notes 1. I refer to feminisms rather than feminism as a way of acknowledging the multiplicity of feminist thought. 2. Bell Hooks, The Will to Change, Men, Masculinity, and Love, London, Simon & Schuster, 2004, 17. 3. Robin D'Angelo's excellent book What Does It Mean to Be White? Developing White Racial Literacy, U.S., Peter Lang. One hundred and nineteen, Chapter Eight, Shades of White Complicity, The End Conscription Campaign, and the Politics of White Liberal Ignorance in South Africa. Daniel Conway. It has become a standing joke that since democracy in South Africa, one cannot find anyone who supported apartheid. Increasingly, some white South Africans claim that they did not know what was happening during apartheid, that it was not their generation that was responsible for apartheid, but that of their parents, and even that it was not as bad for black people during apartheid as it is for white South Africans in post-apartheid South Africa. Point one. The public hearings and official reports of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, TRC, comprehensively documented how white South African complicity was essential to the political, economic, and social operation of apartheid in all its multifaceted forms. In contemporary South Africa, white people deploy multiple discursive strategies to obscure or misrepresent their complicity in the apartheid past and to make claims about their entitlements in the new South Africa. Melissa Stein identified one such strategy of white complicity in the quotation above. The TRC's official report observed another when it concluded the white community often seemed either indifferent or plainly hostile to the work of the commission too, many of whom dismissed the work of the TRC as that of the crying and lying commission. Point three white conservatives were particularly sharp in their denunciation of, and disengagement from, the commission, former President P.W. Bota refused to testify and his successor in office F.W. de Klerk withdrew from the process and used legal channels to successfully suppress the official conclusions of the TRC about his presidency. Point for white liberals, those who were actively opposed to apartheid either by a white anti-apartheid organization such as the Black Sash 5 or End Conscription Campaign, ECC, 6, or who were part of 120 Daniel Conway. The institutionalized opposition in white parliamentary politics, such as the Progressive Federal Party, PFP, 7 embraced the TRC more fully and have been more vocal in apparently proclaiming the non-racial values of the new South Africa. There were also whites active in the African National Congress, ANC, and the United Democratic Front, UDF, 8 who would most likely have been critical of what they perceived as the complicity of white liberals and the institutions of white liberalism with apartheid and thereby more radically leftist and non-complicit in their political motivations. It does not follow, however, that whites who were actively opposed to apartheid were entirely free from complicity, or that they have subsequently embraced the values and political imperatives of the new South Africa. There are gradations and variations in levels of white complicity and these have varying social, political, and economic consequences for South Africa. There is, of course, a difference between white conservative, white liberal, and white radical responses to contemporary South Africa, as there were differences at the time when some whites openly opposed the principles and practices of apartheid while others actively supported and enforced them. As this chapter will argue, white liberals and white radicals were often complicit in white privilege during apartheid and faced difficult choices when choosing strategies of opposition to white minority rule. In the years following the end of apartheid, white liberals and the discourses of white liberalism in South Africa were also complicit in the perpetuation of an often partial, and sometimes entirely ignorant, knowledge about South Africa's past and present. Furthermore, there is evidence that not only have some former white anti-apartheid activists struggled to accept the norms of the new South Africa, but they have been among the ANC's most vocal critics, opposed to its racial transformation agenda and fiercely defensive of their socio-economic posy. 
Shin.9 White supremacy during apartheid presented a clear, morally reprehensible enemy. For many whites, white privilege as it manifests in the new South Africa does not do so. This chapter explores the politics of white complicity, both in terms of how the past is commemorated and obscured and how ongoing privilege is legitimated and justified. Essentially, I argue that these discourses are premised on intentional ignorance about the past and also a desire to ignore and discount inconvenient and disruptive perspectives, arguments, and facts. As will be discussed below, in post-apartheid South Africa, it has been very clear that white South African liberal discourses deliberately seek to shut down and discredit any critique of their position, or exposure of their ongoing racial privilege. This provides evidence that certain white discourses and white people are culpably ignorant of their complicity in ongoing white privilege. Focusing on contemporary debates about framing and commemorating white activism against apartheid, specifically, war resistance in 1980 South Africa, reveals shades of white complicity 121. How a particular group of white liberals seek to emphasize their agency in ending apartheid using discourses that are particularly brittle and hypervigilant to critique. The chapter's focus is a reflexive account of researching and analyzing the social and political activism of the end conscription campaign, a white-led anti-apartheid movement and specifically the responses to published work and analyses of the ECC, including my published work and analyses. The ECC challenged many fundamental aspects of militarized apartheid governance, but my analysis of the movement also traced the compromises and contradictions of the ECC and the gendered political messages it posed. Furthermore, when researching in the 2000s, I became aware that former activists and conscientious objectors were keen to obscure divisions in the movement and emphasize their agency and heroism in opposing apartheid, narratives fed into broader political discourses premised on white demands for socio-economic and political entitlements in contemporary South Africa. As such, I explore the ethics of my own researching and writing of an aspect of apartheid history. I reflect on the complex and often sensitive dilemmas of maintaining intellectual integrity in analyzing the movement while being aware, at the same time, that such a critique would be unwelcome and resisted by former activists. The chapter concludes that the outraged responses to analyzes by some former ECC activists, and resistance to the study and questioning of whiteness as a salient category of research is interrelated with the increased focus on supposed white suffering during apartheid, of conscripts and other soldiers, and the decent ring of injustice suffered by the black population. For example, in focusing on the supposed lingering, unspoken pain of white youth who fought for apartheid as conscripts 10 one not only posits that whites did indeed suffer, but that discussion of that suffering becomes on a PAR with the gross injustices and abuses inflicted on the black population by whites, and white soldiers, in particular, during apartheid. This white victim paradigm legitimates a political claim that it is not only unjust to interrogate white complicity in apartheid and in ongoing racial privilege, but that it is the white community who are the real victims of post-apartheid South Africa. As I will outline below, the focus on white agents of apartheid as victims and the narratives of white anti-apartheid activists have aligned in the new South Africa and perform the same reactionary political function. Both seek to obscure and obfuscate analyses of previous roles played. Yet, whereas to have been an agent of apartheid may now be premised either on victimhood or denial, anti-apartheid activism emphasizes heroism and entitlement. This prevents analysis of how they may have benefited from and constituted themselves and their privileged position through apartheid, and obscures those who really suffered during apartheid. This in turn takes attention away from ongoing racist practices today, and hence becomes complicit in ongoing. 122 Daniel Conway Racial Privilege I argue that that these socio-political narratives are premised on white talk 11 and white ignorance 12, a politics of obscuring that is complicit with ongoing white privilege. Finally, the dilemmas I faced in researching and writing about the ECC activists and objectors and the responses to my published work provoked an uneasy feeling that I too had been complicit in centering white action in helping end apartheid. Whiteness and complicity in South Africa The complicity of South African whites in apartheid has been a dominant theme of post-apartheid social and political discourses, and the complicity of whites in whiteness as a mode of racial privilege and domination has been evident and theorized transnationally. Conceptualizing whiteness requires a focus on the operationalization of racial privilege in social, material, and embodied forms. Point 13 As with other power hierarchies, such as gendered and class-based socio-economic relations, white people are, by their race, to a degree complicit in inequality, prejudice, and exploitation. Whites who wish to challenge and deconstruct whiteness as a form of racial domination face a difficult and contentious task. Point 14 Marilyn Fry makes a direct comparison between being white in society, whiteliness, and gendered authority, that is, being masculine. As she writes, whiteliness, like being masculine, involves a belief in one's authority and in one's own experience as truth. In adding, Chin, Whiteliness entails an unwillingness to be challenged that is protected by perceived white moral goodness. 15 The universal claim of whiteness to truth, knowledge, and morality is brought into sharp and unstable focus when whites and whiteness is analyzed in South Africa. As one of the most infamous and violent institutionalized forms of white supremacy, apartheid automatically conferred political, social, legal, and material benefits on the white community. Apartheid necessitated overt white complicity in political terms, that is voting for successive national party governments to maintain white minority rule and from the 1970s onwards, in military terms, when compulsory conscription for all white men in the South African Defense Force, SADF, was instituted to defend the state against external and internal threat. This was in addition to the everyday racism and silent complicity with injustice that apartheid required in order to perpetuate itself. The Liberation 
struggle against apartheid and the negotiated transition to non-racial democracy in the 1990s necessitated some form of recognition that state-enforced racism was wrong. Confronting and coming to terms with the country's past has been more urgent than in other contexts, as addressing and overcoming racial division and the role of the white community in being both overtly and silently complicit with apartheid is an integral part of nation-building. Shades of White Complicity 123 As discussed above, white liberals in South Africa have, superficially at least, proclaimed their support for the new non-racial dispensation, articulating what Stein and Foster define as New South Africa Speak.16 However, by doing so, white liberalism continues the logic of whiteness as the voice of authority, the definer of social and political reality and as being legitimate and righteous agents in the new order. By defining the terms of non-racialism, progress, transformation and tolerance, liberal whites also ensure that their status is preserved. Point 17 As Makaba notes about contemporary whiteness in South Africa, a very curious feature of our society and its transformation, is that those who were recently our oppressors, have now suddenly become experts and our saviors in transformation. 18 Charles Mills, writing primer Eiley about the US contexts, explains that the articulation of a feel. Good his. Tory for whites 19 in which whites create a more favorable, comfortable, and morally righteous self-construction, is premised on the maintenance of ignorance. Applebaum argues that while not only whites are susceptible to white ignorance, whites are particularly susceptible because they have the most to gain from remaining ignorant. Point 20 Indeed, Mills considers ignorance to be a foundational aspect of the racial contract that perpetuates white power and disempowers black subjects. Point 21 To argue that whites, across national and temporal contexts, are complicit in ignorance raises questions about moral agency and culpability. It also raises the question as to whether claiming that whites collectively engage in a passion for ignorance 22 and on at least some conscious level avoid or denounce difficult knowledge that could destabilize their moral self-image, risks invoking Aaron's caution that where all are guilty, nobody is and therefore no one in particular can be held culpable. Point 23. However, as the South African case demonstrates, many whites proclaim ignorance when even the mere question of complicity in racial inequality and past injustice is raised. Thus, denial of complicity becomes a characterizing feature of white ignorance. Point 24 This does not mean that all white South Africans are equally culpable in the crimes of apartheid. Indeed, white liberal activists were not ignorant of the injustices of apartheid, that is why they actively opposed them. However, as will be discussed below, the extent and premises of this opposition were variable and controversial at the time. There is an ongoing ignorance in denying these variations and this has major implications for contemporary discourses of whiteness. More broadly, it is accurate to claim that all whites were economic, social and, in broad terms, political beneficiaries of apartheid. Therefore, all whites were complicit in apartheid to some degree. One could argue that because of the highly bounded and authoritarian nature of apartheid and the material, social and political advantages autonomy. Cali conferred on white South Africans, non-complicity was not possible for whites during apartheid. The reasons for opposing apartheid and the 124 Daniel Conway Expectations of what political situation would emerge from this challenge diverged considerably between white liberals, both during apartheid and in the post-apartheid era. As the former ECC activist, Janet Cherry remarked in the 1980s, we white anti-apartheid activists all go through a process, to some extent, of breaking away from our backgrounds and our parents and from our very sheltered upbringings 25 in order to challenge apartheid from within white society. This breach from white society implies rejection, defiance, and non-complicity. However, as Cherry states, breaking away was to some extent and varied between activists and also over time. There were degrees of complicity and non-complicity and white liberal activists faced difficult choices in situating their protest in radical or complicit terms. The fraught dynamics of white complicity in apartheid led to friction within and between the white anti-apartheid organizations, as fierce debates about. For example, to what extent the movements should be openly allied to the PFP, or the organizations led by the black community, were continually conducted. The desire to radically reject apartheid and white social norms sat uneasily with the perceived need to be heard by white society and also to appear respectable in white political and social terms. As beneficiaries of the apartheid system, white anti-apartheid activists in South Africa struggled to fully reject their complicity in that system. Intentional Ignorance Ignorance, as an ongoing collective social process, is apparent in South Africa, where distinct modes of white discourse, or White Talk 26 serve to create common sense understandings of the socio-economic and political order that exclude alternatives and quickly and often viciously discipline voices of dissent. As such, complicity may be accomplished via a white ignorance contract. Point 27 This contract is not premised on an absolute ignorance of history or present realities, in the terms that individuals are not and could not possibly be aware of the country's history or broader society, but, more generally, it is an ignorance, in either intentional or unintentional slash unconscious terms, that serves to perpetuate racial hierarchies and neutralize threats to expose or destabilize white privilege. As an economically powerful racial minority that enforced and upheld a violent white supremacist state until 1994, Stein and Foster argue that the central question for whiteness in post-apartheid South Africa can be put simply, how to maintain privilege in a situation in which black people have achieved political power. Point 28 White talk, according to Stein and Foster, intentionally represents the new South Africa in an attempt to define the terms by which, not only white, people will understand it, and relate to it. A great deal is at stake in the battle over whose definitions of the current end. Shades of White Complicity 125
transforming social, economic, and political arrangements and developments should prevail. Point 29 White ignorance is, by its very definition, unstable and subject to contestation. The discursive struggles about the TRC and the subsequent disavowal of white South Africa's complicity with apartheid reveal the fraught social process of attempting to maintain ignorance. The presentation of the past continues to frame political, academic, and social debates. Dissenting voices, particularly white voices, that highlight or problematize ongoing racial privilege, who critique the articulation of feel-good histories for whites, or who even raise and discuss openly the topic of whiteness and complicity have been targeted for criticism. A common feature of responses to academics, social commentators, or politicians who debate or critique whiteness is the use of personal and ad hominem insult, demonstrating a desire to discipline, delegitimize, and silence critique. These responses range from shutting, and shouting, down discussion, to violence. Directed against those who speak about white guilt and complicity. For example, Samantha Weiss, who wrote in an academic paper that white South Africans should accept their moral guilt in apartheid and act with humility and often silence in public discourse, was met with media denouncement, bitter criticism and insults directed against her in internet chat rooms. Point 30 Melissa Stein has been subject to sexist abuse and violent threats on internet forums as a result of her work on whiteness. 31 A former South African paratrooper physically assaulted Anton van Niekerk in his university office after he had published a paper arguing that white South Africans should accept their guilt for the past. 32 In response to an international conference about whiteness held at the University of the Witwatersrand, Wits, in 2013, a national newspaper editor wrote that research into whiteness was boring, navel gazing, and irrelevant in a South Africa that was now claimed to be meritocratic and non racial. 33 Ultimately, these speech and physical acts attempt to deflect attention from whiteness as a mode of privilege, maintain white ignorance about the past, and sidestep questions of complicity. South African universities have become the focus for increasingly bitter contestations of white power and white liberalism. In these contestations, white academics and university managers are faced with a literal loss of power and, more broadly, the loss of a key site for maintaining and perpetuating white discursive and material privilege in South Africa. White liberalism, that defines the university as its model, embodying free speech, tolerance, and progressiveness 34 also stands accused of perpetuating racial privilege, ignoring the racial injustices of the past and stunting the development and racial transformation of South African society. 35 in order to preserve their personal positions of power, essentially, to keep their jobs, and more broadly, to preserve the European liberal model of the university and define the terms by which inclusion and exclusion operates therein, white liberals have been 126 Daniel Conway Intentionally ignorant and on occasion, exceptionally aggressive in defending their power. Their peers and contemporaries in the media have often aided them in this new South Africa speak. 36 This is because predominantly English-speaking universities, such as the University of Cape Town, UCT, and WITS, English-language newspapers, such as the Rand Daily Mail, later the Mail and Guardian, and both English and Afrikaans-speaking academics were at the forefront of white opposition and activism against apartheid. As a result, white liberals have sought to emphasize that transformation should not apply to them, as they were former opponents of apartheid and that, therefore, their ongoing privilege should remain unquestioned. As a profile of a senior white professor at WITS, who was seeking to remove a black pro-vice-chancellor who was critical of white liberal academics, noted. For years, his generation of WITS academics have been fighting conservatism from above and preparing themselves to take over the running of the institution according to their non-racial principles and model of transformation. Now, at the very moment they should be given their chance, the vagaries of history mean that black people must be at the helm. 37. The sense of collective entitlement and injustice engendered when whites are called on to step aside has occasionally and very suddenly evolved into high-profile struggles played out in the media and in parliament. The hidden transcripts of tensions about South Africa's racial transition erupt into life-or-death rhetorical and political struggles when they emerge. 38 As ideology cal battles, and protests that have grown more widespread and bitter, these life-and-death struggles in South African universities have been increasingly difficult to resolve. In 2015, Sayana O'Connell, a mixed-race academic at the UCT was the recipient of hate mail and was pretty much ostracized by her white colleagues after writing an article complaining that UCT had failed to adequately racially transform its staff profile and was still predominantly white. 39 Less than two months later there were mass student protests at UCT led by black students, demanding the removal of a statue of British imperialist. Cecil Rhodes from the campus and calling for UCT to increase the number of black academics and adopt a more inclusive policy towards black students. Point 40 The hashtag Rhodes must fall protests spread to other universities in South Africa and prompted a national debate about racial transformation, or lack thereof, in the South African media. Some white South African academics have been particularly strident in at once proclaiming support for racial transformation yet denouncing the tactics and the rationale of the protesters. For example, UCT academics Jeremy Seekings and Nikolai Natras argued that the hashtag Rhodes must fall protests foster an intolerance of both the diversity of open ion and of reasoned deliberation. Point 41 Rebecca Hodes, also at UCT, criticized. Shades of white complicity 127. The movement for placing racial injustice at the center of its demands, accused it of violent acts and vandalism, and mounted a blinkered defense of white liberalism in South Africa. As the protesters themselves noted, Hodes had gone to great lengths to ignore the contributions of the hashtag Rhodes Must Fall movement by dehistoricizing and decontextualizing our activities. 42 Seekings's, Natras's, and Hodes's responses, along with earlier hostile white liberal responses to transformation at universities, such as by Robert Morrell, 43 all seek to discipline, 
silence and debase efforts to racially transform South African universities and by extension, South African society. As such, they use discourses of white talk, premised on white liberalism, to defend their ongoing privilege and divert attention from the reality of that ongoing privilege and the injustices it perpetuates. At UCT, the statue of Rhodes was removed, but the protests and demands to change the racial profile of the institution students and staff are ongoing and have broadened to incorporate other issues of racial injustice. That these tensions are so vividly exposed and played out in higher education reveals the contradictions between white liberal ALS, who argue they embody the spirit of racial tolerance and progressiveness, and the criticism that white liberals have failed to fully respond to or accept contemporary political and social realities in South Africa. The accusation here is that white liberals essentially are actively and intentionally complicit in defending and perpetuating ongoing forms of racial privilege. They are also culpably enforcing ignorance by denying and obscuring the full contours of racial injustice and exclusion in South African higher education. The researching and writing of white narratives. As discussed above, neither the truth and reconciliation process nor the publication of the TRC's findings settled the question of an official narrative of apartheid or a truly reconciled national community open about acknowledging complicity in past injustices. In the absence of this settled national narrative about the past, different strands of white talk have sought to rewrite the historical narratives of late apartheid. These different strands reveal different degrees of complicity in both the past and present. For example, former white conscripts and soldiers have become increasingly vocal about their personal and collective histories in the SADF via internet chat rooms, dedicated websites, and works of fiction and nonfiction on sale across the bookshops and news agents of South Africa. White liberals in the media and academia have increasingly reproduced these narratives. Such sources either celebrate the SADF and ruminate on the betrayal of former troops by political elites, or somewhat disingenuously proclaim the former wars as unpopular while reproducing nostalgic accounts of life in the army, as a best selling nonfiction. 128 Daniel Conway Book did point 44 An entire genre of fiction has arisen about national service and an academic subdiscipline focusing on the legacies of apartheid's wars has developed. Point 45 In these discourses the negative effects of militarization on whites is emphasized, the evidence of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, in former troops, the coming to terms with wars that were lost and unjust, and the claim that whites were both made victims of apartheid by being subject to conscription and dehumanized by participating in racism. Point 46 While there is evidence, in terms of interpersonal violence, suicide, and other social problems, for the negative effects and legacies of militarization, centering white narratives risks marginalizing the main victims of apartheid, black South Africans and the population of the Southern African region. The focus on PTSD in particular has been criticized as being used by former white troops as an alibi for avoid. In accountability for their actions during the conflict. Point 47 The proclaiming of white heroism or victimhood as a legacy of militarization has characterized white conservative attempts to justify past actions and denounce the present political settlement, but the desire to emphasize heroism and slash or victimhood is also apparent in white liberal talk, and both discursive strategies seek to place whites at the center of public discourse, which deflects attention from, and hence become complicit in, ongoing white socio-economic privilege and the perpetuation of black disadvantage in post-apartheid South Africa. White non-complicity in apartheid. As I have written elsewhere 48 conscientious objectors to military service in the 1980s and the members of the ECC can rightly claim to have opposed the militarized and racist norms of apartheid South Africa. My research on the ECC and its subsequent publication forms part of the cultural discourse on white complicity in apartheid and the legacies of apartheid on white society. As such, it is part of a contentious and politicized field and subject to the same discursive and disciplining pressures. In my work, I conceptualize the gendered nature of apartheid South Africa's militarization, exploring the ECC as a new social movement that opposed the compulsory conscription of all white men into the SADF, and interviewed white men who objected to military service for political reasons. The ECC and conscientious objectors worked in a fraught and contested environment, one in which family and friends could ostracize them for the political stance they had taken and in which the state, and a plethora of social and popular discourses, stigmatized them as masquerading political arguments for what was actually motivated by cowardice, naivete, communism and slash or sexual deviance. In this contested environment there were internal pressures about how to best present a shades of white complicity 129. Campaigning message in order to be heard by a generally unreceptive white audience. As a campaign tactic the ECC eventually adopted a language and identity that was unthreatening to conservative white norms. These tensions around the need to appear respectable in white social and political norms or to be radically challenging in activism and political standpoints brought questions about complicity to the fore. In 2013, I was contacted by a South African, based research student who commented that the former ECC activists she had interviewed have a very clear tendency to put across a particular view and history of the ECC and its members, combined with a positive representation and general lack of CRIT.49 This very much reflected my own experience of researching the ECC, with the exception of Yvonne Toms, who was candid about division centered on his trial for objection. Evidence of divisions over strategy and personal. ITY was present in archives as well as in previous research 50 it is perhaps. Not surprising that a social or political movement would have controversies or divisions, yet some former ECC activists were insistent there were none and angry that I discussed such divisions and debates in my work. Conducting the research in the early to mid-2000s, I became aware how strongly former objectors wanted to emphasize their contribution and the sacrifice they had made to bring about the new South Africa. I also saw how they, in different ways, 
felt overlooked in the new dispensation, being categorized with other whites who had upheld the system. Affirmative action policies in South Africa have more broadly become a critical aspect of white talk and a policy through which whites proclaim their victim status, or as proof of the ANC's maladministration of the country. Some former objectors felt they should not be subject to such policies and were annoyed that they had been. Point 51. It was clear in my research interviews and in subsequent conversations and forums where former ECC activists discussed their life histories, that some openly supported the ANC government, whereas others bitterly opposed it. Helen Zill, a former leading activist in the ECC, became an opposition politician in the Western Cape and later leader of the official opposition party, Democratic Alliance, duh. In this context I became aware that there were expectations of me to present a specific narrative about the ECC that suited specific political ends and that this narrative should erase any reflection on controversies or divisions in the past. In 2009, an end conscription campaign 25th anniversary event was held at the Spire Wine Estate and Resort outside of Cape Town. It was a glamorous occasion opened by the Premier of the Western Cape, Helen Zill, and closed by the Deputy President of South Africa. Art and photography exhibitions, discussions, and music were the center of the commemorations. By Con. Trast, a colleague of mine observed what a sad sight she had witnessed when attending the small anniversary event held by the black former soldiers of the 130 Daniel Conway. Armed wing of the ANC, MK, the previous year, they have been entirely left behind, she remarked, and appeared to be in poor health and poverty. In my subsequent book, I discussed how some former members of the ECC didn't want to hold an anniversary event in 2009, considering it inappropriate for what had been a white movement during apartheid to do so. I also discussed how others wanted to invite the then youth leader of the ANC Julius Malama. Malama has often been sharply critical of the white community and at various times has demanded faster racial transformation including nationalization of white industries and land restitution, to the event, to show him that whites had contributed to the liberation struggle in an attempt to stop his frequent criticisms of and hostility towards the white community. Point 52 When at the event, the most frequent public remark I heard was where is our voice, in a soci. Eddie that fell short of the ideals the former activists had apparently believed. In. Where is our voice also seemed to be code for where was the voice of white South Africa. The event was covered positively and extensively in the local and national press. A documentary about the event was produced and narrated by Desmond Tutu. Former divisions in the movement could be discerned at the event, cheers of adulation greeted the introductory welcome by Helen Zill by some in the audience, but others muttered at how they had never supported Zill because of her then allegiance to the white liberal PFP. In the discussions during the weekend some openly expressed their ongoing support for the ANC government, others bitterly attacked it. Former activists reflected on their motivations for involvement in the campaign, for some, there were deeply held political convictions, for others personal fears for the future of their children as potential conscripts, but still others openly conceded that their involvement was socially motivated, the ECC was a space for alternative youth culture, music, and sex, and the political motives and potential dangers associated with anti-apartheid activism were largely obscured. It was in this highly politicized environment that my book on the end conscription campaign was published in 2012. As an academic book, I had not fully anticipated how easily accessible it would be in South Africa and thus how widespread its impact would also be. Published in paperback, it was widely distributed across South Africa and sold alongside the other literature about South Africa's apartheid wars through mainstream bookshops in shopping malls and airports. In hindsight, it is clear that the nature of South African society and the fact that a white liberal elite continues to occupy the higher echelons of sections of the media and society meant that the work was read and commented on beyond the usual confines of academia. As the first single study to be published about the ECC in the post-apartheid era, I was aware that I might be subject to opprobrium from former ECC activists and other white South Africans who could be deeply invested in particular modes of presenting their past activism for contemporary political ends. By reflecting Shades of White Complicity 131 On what I had observed at the ECC anniversary, on the divisions of the ECC and even by adopting a feminist and gendered analysis, my work may be interpreted very differently in white popular culture as opposed to peer academics. In 2013, I was invited to speak at an academic conference at Rhodes University about the legacies of apartheid's wars and at the South African National Arts Festival about my work. In the weeks leading up to the conference, an article was published in the Mail and Guardian newspaper attacking my book. I was given no right of reply. Written by a former ECC activist, the article took exception to almost every aspect of the work, from the front cover, that reproduced an ECC poster, the wording of the title, to the referencing style, in text, the use of academic language and theory, the focus on gender and women activists, the implication that the ECC's tactics were in any way related to the broader liberation movement's shift in the later 1980s and also the claim that there were divisions in the movement, the ECC was factionless according to the author, if not the evidence present in the archives, point 53 the article also misrepresented a number of key arguments and entirely ignored others. I recalled how the white editor of the Mail and Guardian had also been present at the ECC anniversary celebrations and the newspaper had published some of the most glowing tributes to the movement at the time. The newspaper article sought to debase the analysis of the ECC in the same terms as white conservative and white liberal attacks on academic and other critiques of white privilege discussed previously. As such, it was a discourse sought to maintain ignorance about the past. Upon arriving at the conference I realized that the main focus of the event was on white experiences of apartheid rather than on South African society more broadly. 
Attendees were mainly white former SADF soldiers, privileged white former ECC activists and South African liberal white academics and authors of works of fiction that focus on apartheid wars. The conference or got Nizer introduced herself as the director of the Legacies of the Apartheid Wars Project, and announced that the conference would be a healing space for compassionate conversations between former foes, albeit predominantly between white people. It was a deeply uncomfortable experience, sharpened not least because the venue of Rhodes University is itself a predominantly white institution that embodies a lack of transformation and was in complete contrast to the poverty of the township at the opposite end of the city. The focus on the effects of conscription and apartheid wars on white society, ranging from PTSD to suicide and guilt seemed more premised on recent traying white experiences of apartheid and claiming and proclaiming white victimhood, than a productive exploration of ongoing racial inequalities and white agency, or lack thereof, in socio-economic transformation. It was a white space, without critically interrogating whiteness or the ongoing white. Privilege in South Africa 132 Daniel Conway It became clear that the discourses at the conference were premised on forms of white liberal ignorance and complicity. The chair of my panel at the conference announced that some former ACC members had, in light of the Mail and Guardian review, refused to attend the conference because of my presence. At the conference some former activists loudly attacked me for my work, although, by their own admission, none had actually read my book. However, they had read the Mail and Guardian review. One member of the audience even announced that she had not read the book and would refuse to read it in the future, something I consider to be a remarkable ex-praise sign of ignorance and intolerance to academic discourse. Although a difficult experience, it was a somewhat unsurprising one and I reflected on what it revealed, and also concealed, about discourses of whiteness in contemporary South Africa. By polemically attacking my socio-political analysis of the ECC. And my right to even embark of the study as a younger, UK-born outsider. And even refusing to read the work, the audience reflected how the white liberal discourses at the conference were premised on ignorance and a desire to present a celebratory and unproblematized account of white social and political agency in ending apartheid. The attacks mirrored those directed at other white, and black, academics that critique whiteness and also, in similar terms, inflated what might have been an intellectual discussion about the analysis of a now-defunct political movement into a life-or-death struggle over whose narrative would prevail in the account of the recent past. This is a struggle that has taken place in South African academia, but in 2013, it also took place in South African politics. In 2013, the Da Party, South Africa's official opposition that emerged out of the white liberal PFP, launched a campaign to highlight the contribution of the former PFP MP Helen Sussman to the anti-apartheid struggle and also the anti-apartheid NECC, activism of the current Da leader, Helen Zill. The Da's mess. Sage, that white liberals were and remain at the vanguard of the liberation struggle and that the black government has betrayed the ideals of liberation provoked considerable controversy, with debate focusing on the legitimacy of the old white parliament and the reality and extent of Helen Sussman's actual opposition to or complicity with apartheid governance. Point 54 The responses to my work drew from, and took place within, this discursive context, and revealed a desire to control and frame the ECC's history with an aim to maximize and celebrate white agency in ending apartheid, narratives that belie the evidence held in the archives. These narratives also sought to wrest focus away from black experiences during apartheid, shifting it to white experiences. In debunking critique of white liberal activism during apartheid, white talk sought to construct and valorize white heroes of the liberation movement, and recenter whites as the authority of South African history and society. Shades of White Complicity 133 Academic research can be used to confer legitimacy and importance upon actors and movements. Moreover, merely publishing research amplifies the significance of the research subject. This can generate further discourse that influences popular perceptions. I believe I was invited, in part, to the Legacy of Apartheid's Wars Conference and to the South African National Arts Festival in order to provide this academic legitimacy and amplification. In many respects I had been complimentary about the ECC, and objectors had demonstrated how their campaigns had helped destabilize militarization and increase white social and political fractures that fed into the demise of apartheid. However, in my book I openly discussed the politicized and problematic nature of white discourses about activist pasts in contemporary South Africa and critiqued the movement's rationale and divisions. In addition, my book was on sale in popular bookshops across South Africa and reviewed by the popular press. In resisting complicity to conforming to the white liberal NAR. Rative of the ECC and seeking to expose and destabilize intentional white ignorance, while having a relatively high public profile for my published work and presence at the National Arts Festival, I marked myself as a target. Attacks on my work sought to undermine legitimate academic discourse, and served as an opportunity to overemphasize the ECC's role and narratives of white agency in ending apartheid. Conclusion. Transnationally, all white people are complicit to a greater or lesser extent in the racial contract that confers privilege and entitlement to whites and whiteness. In South Africa, the breach of this racial contract by the dramatic ending of apartheid, the election of a black-led government and the open exploration of the past and who should be held to account for it, has raised the stakes for whites, who now potentially see their positions of privilege exposed and their power diminished. The desire to present the ECC in only heroic terms and to aggressively shout down non-insiders from analyzing or critiquing the history of the movement reveals not only intentional ignorance and a commitment to modernist and reductive understandings of history, but a desire to keep whites and whiteness at the center and displace black experiences, both in the past and the present. The rise of the focus on the legacies of apartheid's wars, both in popular culture and academia has 
primarily been concerned with white suffering and thus with the construction of a notion white victimhood equivalent to and even superseding the experience of black people during apartheid. This directly contributes to the white conservative claims that it is the whites that suffer and are the victims of the new South Africa. In this complex and fraught political context, I, as a 134 Daniel Conway researcher and writer, faced a dilemma over the extent of my personal complicity and I was well aware when writing my PhD and subsequent publications that I was balancing academic integrity with the expectations of those I researched to tell their story in the terms they wanted. By not fully satisfying the latter, I unintentionally provoked a life or death discursive struggle about the hidden transcripts of white South Africa's past. It has become commonplace in contemporary South Africa for white liberals to loudly denounce other political and social actors who threaten to expose or damage their ongoing racial privilege, as well as to define the terms of debate in their own self-interest. As Pierre de Vos commented, when discussing the DAS rebranding of its white liberal apartheid past, how you engage with the past is profoundly political. But because of the explosive political power of the past and the real and imaginary memory of it, there is a tendency to simplify the past to suit individuals' emotional and political or other selfish needs 55 white liberals' dominant positions in leading university ties and media outlets of the country, as well as their ongoing economic and, in some geographical locations, political power gives them the opportunity to occupy and to a greater or lesser extent control very influential public platforms. In response to challenge and critique white talk combines a disingenuous proclamation of support for the post-apartheid socio-political order with a simultaneous rejection of the very means by which such an order can really come to pass and a genuinely empowered black community can arise. My experiences with the former ECC activists and objectors, as a researcher and later as an author, is a small, but vivid example of how a section of white liberals seek to discipline and reject any critique that threatens their perceived power interests and to exploit the opportunity to recenter focus on themselves. And decenter black experiences. The broader and sharp social and political. Conflicts that continue to arise in South African universities reveal both the lack of genuine transformation at those institutions and the efforts and lengths to which white liberal academics and university managers will go to preserve their personal and ideological positions. In these struggles, how the past is framed relates to how whites sit as privileged subjects in the present. If white liberals are complicit in ongoing racial privilege and are culpably or unintentionally perpetuating ignorance about the past and present, how should whites respond in contemporary South Africa? Melissa Stein believes that some white liberals are making demands for recognition about their activist pasts that they do not deserve, being part of the anti-apartheid struggle by choice was vastly different from fighting for one's survival due to being trapped by apartheid's racism 56 she argues, further, that petulance for not being rewarded for past contribution to the cause only betrays that an element of paternalism must have informed the choice in the first place. Point 57 From this perspective, former ECC activists should accept their place in South African. Shades of White Complicity 135. History as a marginal one and aside from the main dynamics of the black liberation struggle. They should also be aware of their ongoing and highly privileged status in an unequal South Africa. For vice, because of white complicity and unresolved guilt, the community should be silent in political affairs. Point 58 Eusebius Makassia qualifies this and says that whites actually do have the right to speak, but he advises South Africa's white population to be. Mindful of how your whiteness still benefits you and gives you unearned privileges. Engage black South Africans with humility, and be mindful of not reinforcing whiteness as normative, just as a loud, boisterous, rugby obsessive chief executive should take care of his unearned privileges as an aggressive, masculine male in the boardroom. Point 59. White liberals have mostly disregarded this advice and it remains imperative that scholars and public commentators continue to expose and deconstruct both white complicity and white ignorance about the past and present racial injustices in South Africa.